Ladies and gentlemen. And good morning to Mr. Yoga Adiwinarto, the Director of Operations and Safety, Transjakarta. Mr. Vic Vaidya, the Senior Partner and VP EV Systems Engineering, Manifold Business Solutions. Mr. Vijay Kumar Electra, Associate General Manager. Mr. Sutanopati, the ITDP Finance Consultant. Ms. Bianca Makedo, the Investment and Partnership Manager for the Zebra Project at C40. Mr. Firman, the Advocacy and Procurement Guidance of Jakarta Good Services Procurement Service Agency. Mr. Rus Effendi, Policy Analyst, Fiscal Policy Agency, Ministry of Finance. Mr. Chandra Rahmat, the Head of Department of Design, Engineering, Standardization, and Electric Bus of Transjakarta. Mr. Lokesh Chandra, the General Manager of Best Undertaking, and Mr. Insan Rido, the Head of Fleet Evaluation and Development Transjakarta, and of course, to all the participants of this webinar. And welcome to Jakarta E-Mobility Workshop Day 3, Workshop on Technology Selection and Business Model for Electric Buses and Peer-to-Peer -peer Knowledge Exchange. My name is Sarah Wayne, and it is an honor for me to be able to be your host and moderator for today's event. And before we begin our event this morning, please do allow me to first inform you regarding the house rules of our event. First of all, we would like to inform you that when you are entering a workshop, please do select or click join audio. And next, we'd like to also ask you to please mute your microphone and please turn off your camera or your video when you are not speaking. And we'd like to also hope you to make sure or ensure your internet connection is stable to be able to follow or take part in our discussion smoothly. And next, we'd like to also ask you to please make sure there is no background noises when you are speaking and avoid accessing this workshop nearby other users because it may cause echo or feedback noise. And if you have any questions regarding our event or webinar, please do write your questions in the chat box available. And ladies and gentlemen, we also have an interpretation feature available for you to use and how to use it First, you may see the interpretation button or selection at the bottom screen of your Zoom application. Please do click the interpretation button. And then next, you may choose the language of your choice as either in English or Bahasa Indonesia. If you would like to listen to the discussion in English, please do click the interpretation English selection. And if you'd like to listen to the discussion atau ingin mengikuti Diskusi dalam bahasa Indonesia, silahkan pilih pilihan interpretasi. Select Indonesian if you would like to listen to the Indonesian interpretation. And we'd like to also inform you that we have the JBI, or Juru Bahasa Isyarat, or Sign Language Interpreter, to also help you and assist you in following our discussion this morning. And next, ladies and gentlemen, this is the general, our brief rundown of our event where we will be following a certain panel discussion. And before this morning, we'll also have some welcoming remarks followed by presentations and panel discussion. And then we will also be having a discussion in a breakout room later on in our event that is part of our agenda this morning, ladies and gentlemen. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we'd also like to ask you to kindly, please once again ensure that due to the smooth running of our event, the host and co-host reserves the right or force the mute audio of participants who are not speaking that may unintentionally causing disruption to the event. Of course, this is to ensure that the audio of the speaker and interpreter remains clear at all times. I'd like to also remind to all the speaker to please do make sure that you speak slowly and clearly as well to help assist the interpreters to translate the speak our audio to the participants of Zoom as well. And we hope you understand and 
We thank you for your cooperation and understanding for this matter. And ladies and gentlemen, before we start, I would like to also introduce our speakers today. We have Mr. Yoga Adivinarto, Mr. Vikran Vaidya, Mr. Fijay Kumar, Mr. Sutanupati, and Ms. Bianca Makedo, who will be sharing their insights and delivering presentations for us today. And now, ladies and gentlemen, after that, we will also be having a panel discussion between TransJakarta, the OEMs, Ministry of Industry, and Ministry of Finance on e-bus rollout action plan, which will be led by Mr. Gita Fajar Saptiani, the Senior Project Advisor at C40 Cities Finance Facility. And then next, ladies and gentlemen, the next session, our breakout room, is also to be a peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange between Electra, the government of Jakarta, and bus operators, the case study of Mumbai, Pune, and Hyderabad, which be, will be led and is also organized by Musharada Golapudi, the ITDP International e-mobility expert. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we will begin our day three on the workshop on technology selection and business model for electric buses and peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite Mr. Yoga Adi Winarto, the Director of Operational and Safety of TransJakarta to deliver his welcoming remarks and to open our third day workshop today. To Mr. Yoga, the time and screen is yours. Thank you, Sarah. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and also good evening. Uh, welcome to Jakarta, virtually at least. Uh, welcome to Mr. Vijay, Mr. Fikram, uh, Mr. Sutano, my friend, and also um, Ms. Bianca, uh, the speakers for um, today's uh, workshop. Um, the Jakarta mark um, yesterday marked a historical moment for public transport in Jakarta and also maybe Indonesia. As yesterday, the governor of Jakarta officially launched the operation of the first 30 electric buses in Trans Jakarta service. This is the first electric buses that runs in Indonesia for commercial public transport. The first of many more to come, or at least in Jakarta and also Trans Jakarta services. Now, Jakarta has become the latest city to join the e-mobility community, especially on the public transport world. So cities like in Latin America, Europe, also Asia, then we are part of the, the gang now. Uh, together with the city of Jakarta, TransJakarta also aims to shift the electric mobility fully by 2030. With over 10,000 fleets, will be all made electrics within the next eight years. This is obviously not an easy task to do since it involves new technologies, new financing challenges, as well as new capacity to build in the operation and maintenance. But thanks to the international support provided to Jakarta government and Trans Jakarta, we have started to understand more and more on these new needs. The challenges faced by Trans Jakarta in the process of implementing the electric bus was a long and windy road. We started the journey in 2019 by only knowing very little or almost nothing about electric bus. The only thing that we knew was that it doesn't require fuel to operate. Thank God we were right. In late 2019, we began the e-bus pilot development with the assistance from the Asian Development Bank and later followed by the C40 cities through its climate, uh, climate financing facilities or CFF. Luckily, the help did not end there. Later on, many organizations such as ITDP, UNEP CTCN, TUMI, and also UKPAC they came to offer uh, more support to Trans Jakarta and also to the city. With this, all of this support, we are able to see where we are going, when we are going to make it happen. The only thing that we are still working out is how we are doing it. So for example, now we have the roadmap that by 2025, 50% of our fleet will be electric. And that from 2023 onwards, all the new big and medium buses that we procure will be electric. We also plan to first electrify the, the 20, 12 meter buses feeder or so-called non-BRT bus where technology is more simple. And next year, we aim to start the pilot for the BRT routes with 12 meter and hopefully 18 meter one when the technology has become more mature. And then later on, we will also start the electric, to electrify the medium bus. And lastly, 
uh, the, the fleet that we will electrify are the small micro buses, where the population of this fleet might reach to 6,000 uh, buses alone. The development of first e-bus pilot project in Jakarta is also approved. The collaboration can happen even through long distance meeting like today. To this day, I've never met with any of the technical team from CFF and ITDP like Sutanu or Pawan in person who have been a great help to us in forming the business and technical model for the e pilot project in Jakarta. We realize that there are so much more to be done. We still need to think and prepare how we can electrify the BRT service where the challenges lie on battery capacity versus passenger capacity on buses. We also need to find the suitable technology and also infrastructure to support the operation for these BRT buses. There are also other challenges such as financing, which is important, especially when it comes to our microbus operator partners, where many came from the small and medium enterprise cooperative. Compared to 2019, we're probably not in a better position in answering all of these challenges, but at least now, we can ask the right questions to the right organizations that have been following, you know, uh, offering us many, many assistance. So perhaps after all, you know, we are in a much better now. I hope this workshop today can bring many knowledge exchange and also experience sharing, especially for the participants in Jakarta and also from Indonesia. So we know what other cities have done it right and also avoid what they did wrong. I would like to thank ITDP and all of the supporting organizations, organizations as well as the um, audience and also the speakers um, that, that have been involved to organize this valuable event. I wish you all good health and also great workshop session today. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, terima kasih, Mr. Yoga Adiwinato, for the welcoming remarks. And yes, we do hope everyone here will be having a fruitful and also insightful discussion. And before we start our discussion this morning, ladies and gentlemen, we will first have a photo session. Therefore, I would like to kindly invite all the speakers and also the panelists of our event this morning to please turn on your camera and prepare yourself for a photo opportunity. Once again, I would like to invite the speakers and also the panelists of our event this morning to please open your camera, turn on your camera and prepare yourselves to take a picture together virtually. All right then, let's see here. Is everyone ready for the panelists and speakers? All right, please uh, smile to the camera. On the count of three, we're taking two pictures. This is the first one. And one, two, three. And once again, one, two, three. All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your availability and for opening your camera. First, before we start our panel discussion for the photo session or the photo opportunity. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as mentioned before, we will be having our starting our panel discussion. So therefore, before we start our first presentation this morning, I would like to encourage you and encourage your active participation to please write down your questions in our Zoom Q&A box to pose your questions for the for the panelists and also speakers this morning. And we will be reading the questions to the speakers during the question and answer session of the panel discussion. Please do state your name, your institution, and also to whom the question is addressed to. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin our first presentation this morning which will be presented by Mr. Vikran Vaidya, the senior partner of, and also the VP of EV Systems, Engineering, E-Manifold Business Solutions. And he will be presenting the BEBs and charging technology selection. So without further ado, I would like to pass on the screen to Mr. Vikran Vaidya. Thank you. Uh, good morning, all. Good morning, Mr. Uh, Vadia, and we'd like to remind you, Mr. Vadia, for your 
uh, presentation time will be 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Please continue. Yeah, uh, can you switch to next slide or? Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we'll first go through uh, what are the different uh, technology options uh, in electrification. Uh, we often hear there are hybrid buses, uh, hybrid electric buses, there are plug-in hybrid electric buses, the battery electric buses, and then uh, there is also uh, the, the fuel cell electric buses on the horizon. So uh, we go through uh, we, uh, what each one of those mean, uh, what are uh, the different uh, manufacturers and models available, um, and then we will go through uh, uh, what we uh, believe and practice as a systematic process of planning a deployment. Um, and then uh, uh, we'll go through the, the charging strategy selection uh, aspect of it as well. So uh, starting with uh, the bus electrification technologies, as I said, there are uh, multiple options available, which successfully help us uh, electrify uh, uh, the buses. Uh, we have uh, uh, the plug-in hybrid electric buses or plug-in hybrid electric vehicles as they are called. They have an uh, uh, IC engine, uh, but the, the main traction is by an electric motor, uh, which is powered by a battery. And this battery can also be charged using uh, uh, the, the plug socket. Uh, uh, the hybrid electric buses, uh, as we call it, the HEVs, they uh, have to be charged only by the onboard engine, whereas the plug-in hybrid electric buses uh, can be charged using uh, a plug, as the name suggests. Yeah. Uh, then we have extended range electric vehicles where uh, uh, it, it's a, a slight uh, progress from the plug-in hybrid where uh, the majority of uh, the, uh, the energy is stored in the battery through uh, the plug-in sockets. And uh, the engine is only there as a range extender. Uh, it only comes on when the battery state of charge falls below a certain level. Uh, then we have the battery electric buses, uh, uh, the EEBs as we call it, uh, which uh, are uh, uh, completely electric in the sense there is no IC engine on board. Uh, there is a, a big battery on board which uh, is supposed to provide it the range required to do its daily uh, running or, or if there is uh, a lot of running done during the day, we have to manage it through opportunity charging. Uh, uh, another subset of this are the trolley buses, uh, which uh, continuously have access to the power through overhead lines. Uh, these buses do still have a battery uh, to take care of the transients that uh, uh, the bus may see in terms of operation. Uh, but uh, their primary source is the overhead line. They are quite similar to trams uh, that a lot of cities had uh, some time back. I think we have moved out from there. Uh, but uh, the difference being the trolley buses do not have, need a rail. Uh, they, have, they, they have normal uh, wheels just like other buses. Uh, then we have the fuel cell electric buses where uh, the, uh, uh, the there is an opportunity to store uh, another energy source, uh, which is hydrogen. And the hydrogen is converted into electricity by the fuel cells, uh, which process the hydrogen and provide electricity. Uh, this electricity uh, uh, is uh, provided to the traction motor through a battery or a supercapacitor, uh, again, to take care of the transients and so that you can actually size the fuel cell is smaller, uh, thereby reducing the cost as well as the mass of the vehicle. Uh, and then uh, the, the battery actually takes care of high power demands, uh, just like uh, in, in extended range electric vehicles as well. Uh, sorry, in, in the plug-in hybrids as well. Uh, uh, we have a technology comparison uh, uh, at the bottom of the graph where uh, we can see uh, what kind of fuel is used, uh, what kind of propulsion is used. So we can see we have uh, IC engine going up to extended range electric vehicles and, and post that it is all electric motor. 
Uh, then uh, in terms of fuel, we have the fossil fuels again uh, going up to where the IC engines are used. And after that, uh, it's the electricity, the grid electricity, uh, that is the primary source. Uh, in terms of uh, fuel cell electric vehicles, it would be the hydrogen uh, that would be the primary energy source. Uh, then uh, the onboard energy source uh, are uh, the fuel tanks uh, in case of IC engines, uh, as well as plug-in hybrid and uh, extended range electric vehicles. Uh, though uh, the batteries, as you can see, the batteries uh, keep increasing in size as we go to the battery electric buses. And then uh, again, they reduce uh, in size uh, when we talk about fuel cell electric buses. Uh, the energy consumption uh, or the efficiency uh, uh, that uh, these vehicles provide, uh, the energy consumption of an IC engine bus is much higher because the IC engine uh, efficiency is much lower as compared to an electric motor. Uh, uh, as we successively bring in electric uh, traction and the efficiency increases and the energy consumption per kilometer decreases. Uh, the battery electric bus being the lowest uh, in terms of the energy consumption on board. Uh, and then we have uh, the fuel cell uh, electric vehicles where again uh, it, it goes up a bit because uh, there is conversion efficiency of hydrogen to electricity and then uh, usage of it uh, to power the vehicle. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, uh, uh, the most demanding are uh, the, the battery electric buses and the fuel cell electric buses. Um, although uh, we see it's, it's a filling station, but, but hydrogen filling, uh, storage and filling uh, has its own challenges. Uh, in terms of charging infrastructure, it, uh, uh, it still is coming up in most countries where uh, uh, the, the fast charger availability is uh, still uh, being worked on. And uh, that is why uh, the infrastructure is uh, primarily uh, a big uh, 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 challenge as of now. Uh, but there are things happening uh, where a lot more uh, focus is going on the infrastructure and not just the vehicle design. Next, please. Uh, these are the global trends uh, where uh, we see uh, the, the various uh, drivers or motivations to shift to electric buses. Uh, we have uh, uh, primarily the, the climate change uh, as well as the availability of power uh, or the energy source driving uh, the unique characteristics of uh, those particular uh, uh, adoption of a type of electric. Next, please. So uh, going uh, a little deeper into uh, where uh, we have uh, the primary manufacturing of electric buses, uh, we have the top manufacturers listed at the bottom corner, uh, where uh, we see Utong, Daimler, uh, King Long, and so on. So they, those are currently uh, the top suppliers of electric buses. Uh, we have uh, China, uh, Europe, uh, the US and uh, uh, a couple of setups in uh, Latin America. And then uh, in India, there are uh, a couple of OEMs, uh, indigenous OEMs, as well as uh, the, uh, uh, the multinationals who have set up the production capacities. Next, please. So this is an array of uh, 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 various manufacturers that uh, are manufacturing electric buses. Uh, as well as hybrid electric buses, some of them do manufacture hydro, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, hybrid electric buses, as well as the hydrogen fuel cell buses. Very few are getting into that as of now. Next, please. Uh, this is a comparison of uh, uh, the couple of battery technologies which are used in e-buses. Uh, we have currently most of the buses running lithium ion phosphate uh, subchemistry of the lithium ion chemistry, uh, which is uh, uh, the most cost effective. Uh, it has very good thermal stability, having a very high thermal renovation pressure. Uh, however, uh, there are limitations in terms of how much power can be drawn uh, and the energy density itself, uh, where uh, we start uh, uh, having to sacrifice the volume as well as the gross vehicle mass uh, of the vehicle uh, just to accommodate 
more and more or bigger size batteries. Uh, there is a, a distinct trend uh, uh, shifting towards lithium uh, uh, NMC or NCM, which is lithium nickel manganese cobalt subchemistry, uh, which provides a, a, a relatively better energy density and volume density for packaging bigger size batteries into the bus. Uh, however, there are risks uh, like the thermal runaway temperature is lower, so it needs uh, cooling and it needs uh, monitoring much more than the lithium ion phosphate batteries. Um, and uh, the, the current that can be drawn uh, uh, is uh, still uh, uh, comparable to the lithium ion phosphate, the power that can be drawn. Uh, Cost-wise, they are slightly costlier than the lithium ion phosphate as of now. Uh, there is also uh, 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 some interest in the lithium titanium oxide buses. Uh, only one uh, deployment has been there. Uh, there are multiple prototypes and studies going on. Uh, this has much lower energy density. However, uh, it can take a very high uh, uh, charging rate um, and it has a very high thermal runaway temperature. Uh, so stability wise, this chemistry or subchemistry uh, is uh, 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 very good. Uh, in in uh, the deployment phase, uh, what we would look at is smaller sized batteries which are charged more often. Uh, this subchemistry also offers a much higher life uh, as compared to uh, the other uh, uh, more renowned subchemistries of lithium ion. Uh, uh, the bottom graph also uh, explains that uh, there is also a consolidation in terms of research on these subchemistries because of uh, the, the clear uh, choice in terms of uh, applications to electric vehicles. Next, please. So uh, let us go through some of the considerations uh, when uh, we talk about battery electric bus deployment. Uh, next, please. Uh, it has been uh, often the experience of uh, the initial pilots uh, in India as well as over the world, uh, uh, even those which, in which we have been involved initially, uh, that a lot of uh, aspects uh, of deployment of an electric bus are missed. Um, the electric bus is not just the vehicle, uh, it comes along with its system. Uh, we need charging infrastructure. The maintenance is lower, but the inspection requirements and the monitoring requirements are higher. Uh, also, the, the energy infrastructure uh, that backs up the charging, uh, particularly the fast charging, uh, needs to be uh, looked at uh, in well in advance. There are uh, multiple approvals that are required. There is also a choice of uh, uh, which uh, supply uh, would be tapped into from the grid, uh, depending upon uh, uh, the reliability of that particular line or supply. Uh, and then uh, each of these uh, uh, can, if, if not paid attention to, can result in uh, uh, a loss of SLAs uh, in terms of uh, the e-bus operations later. So uh, uh, to overcome this, uh, what we recommend is a step-by-step -step process uh, uh, before going into deployment, a detailed study uh, in terms of uh, the routes uh, in terms of uh, the energy requirements of those routes, uh, the Mr. depot Rivaldia, selection. Your remaining time is three minutes. Thank you. Uh, uh, the, uh, the depot selections, the, uh, uh, the deployment uh, prioritization of those routes, and then uh, choosing the right size of battery, the right size, the right spec of the bus uh, will ensure a lot of these are uh, not risks uh, or they are low in risk uh, when the deployment happens. Next, please. Uh, this is a comparison of uh, uh, the ranges that we have in terms of diesel buses, CNG buses, uh, and you can see an equivalent electric bus uh, with a full charge uh, uh, provides uh, less than half of uh, what the, the diesel and the CNG buses provide. However, the energy efficiency or the, the consumption per kilometer is uh, much better in terms of electric buses. So they are indeed efficient uh, and they also help us recover some of the energy in terms of regenerative braking. Uh, and that way the overall efficiency is much better. 
uh, as the battery energy density grows or we look at uh, uh, opportunity charging uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, issue with the electric bus the range anxiety as we call it will uh, uh, will be mitigated as a risk next please so here uh, we have a uh, uh, link uh, some of the typical root profiles or root characteristics with the energy consumption uh, the the air conditioning uh, uh, obviously adds a significant amount of energy demand uh, however, the air conditioning uh, is uh, more dependent on the duration of the trip rather than the distance. And that is something uh, to be considered when the routes are being prioritized for electrification. Uh, then uh, the, the length of the trip as well as the max speed during the trip also determines the propulsive energy that uh, would be required. As you can see, one of the routes stands out where the propulsive energy is over uh, 116 kilowatt hours. Uh, that route is uh, having both a very high stop speed as well as uh, 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 the highest distance among all. Uh, and then uh, there is some sensitivity in terms of passenger loading, uh, both uh, for propulsive energy as well as the air conditioning, as the air conditioning has to work harder with more occupants inside the bus. Next, please. So uh, these are the steps uh, that uh, we recommend doing. Uh, uh, we start with a reference e-bus. Uh, we do the route selection uh, based on the characteristics of the route. This requires a lot of uh, data collection on those routes in terms of speed versus load, as well as the terrain, uh, which is uh, the grade versus distance and the passenger loading. Uh, based on that, uh, each of the route can be analyzed for what energy consumption it requires. Uh, and then based on that, uh, a combination of the battery size and the charging strategy feasible uh, in that site uh, uh, could, be, uh, uh, could be finalized. And uh, based on that, uh, the, the procurement the approvals uh, can proceed. Uh, this actually helps do a, a much more systematic planning and reduces a lot of risk uh, in the operations. Next, please. Mr. Faria, your time uh, is up. Uh, please do wrap your presentation in the following one minute. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there are multiple uh, uh, charging techniques. Uh, I won't go into detail of each of these. Uh, 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 next, please. So uh, the most important uh, part of uh, selecting a charging strategy is uh, when uh, to charge. Uh, the charging has to be scheduled within the timetable of the bus uh, where to charge depending upon the battery size trade-off and the availability of charging infrastructure or the energy infrastructure and how to charge uh, depending on uh, uh, what is the time available uh, whether you go for fast charging slow charging uh, uh, en route uh, or even swap battery swap uh, uh, is, is an option that is available so it's, it's a case-to-case -case basis study that has to be done uh, and uh, the most optimal solution uh, to be found out based on uh, uh, the energy, uh, the, the cost, as well as the risk uh, that uh, that strategy would pose. Next, please. Uh, so this is a, a summary of uh, the, the various considerations required uh, for the charging strategy selections. I summarize them in the last slide itself. Uh, next, please. So uh, that is all uh, uh, I had. Uh, we can have some questions if we have time, sir. Thank you, Mr. Vadia. Yes, we can continue the discussion and the question and answer session later on. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a question for Mr. Vadia, please do type them down and please do state your name and also your institution. And therefore, we will continue to our next presentation this morning, which will be presented by Mr. Vijay Kumar, the Electra Associate General Manager, and he will be presenting e-bus planning, operation and maintenance, case study in Mumbai, Pune and Hyderabad. Without further ado, please welcome Mr. Vijay Kumar.
And Mr. Vijay yeah. Kumar, yeah. your okay. presentation time is 15 minutes. Good morning, all. Thank you, Sara. Thank you uh, uh, for moderating this session. And thank you, Yoga, for, for giving such a uh, fantastic idea about Trans Jakarta and Indonesian public transport. And congratulations to Trans Jakarta for introducing 30 electric buses in the month of March uh, uh, 2022. Uh, and uh, it's a good choice that you have made. We are also using the same buses, like same technology buses in India here. And I also would like to thank Charada and I, ITDP for giving us this opportunity to interact with you and share our views on this program. I'll take you through uh, the presentation quickly. I believe the presentation is visible, right? Yeah. So, uh, Electra Green Tech Limited, which is India's largest electric bus manufacturer, uh, we have delivered across India uh, for an about more than 750 electric buses for the last five to six years in the country. We are largest electric bus manufacturer in India. Our parent company is Mega Engineering and Infrastructure Limited company. This company owns more than 25 companies globally, and we have a turnover of 22,000 crores and we have our legacy for over 30 years. So Electra Green Tech Limited is one of the division in uh, uh, Mega Engineering. Uh, we have a technology tie-up with BYD uh, Auto Limited, uh, uh, the same products that you are also using in Indonesia. So you all know what are the advantages of electric buses, which will help us to, uh, uh, to, uh, to majorly reduce the uh, tile pipe em emissions and then uh, more or like less what we have to focus is that how these electric buses are going to help the whole country, whole nation to stabilize the grids and how to save the energy which we are wasting in night times in terms of energy transmission losses. And these Mr. are the Vijay other advantages. Can you yeah. please um, slow down your pace of uh, speech to help the got interpreters it. to translate? Got speech. it, got it. So, uh, Volatra has provided its electric buses uh, to various STUs in the country for an about 40 plus STUs in the country for them to experience what is an electric bus and operate it in their own territory, in their operational uh, uh, hazardness, all that, so that they can feel what is this, I mean, how electric buses operate, whether it is feasible, or uh, can these electric buses uh, really conquer the routes and roads in those cities? That is how we have given our buses, offered our buses to all other STUs uh, to experience them. And then they started getting into deploying electric buses in these STUs. This is the journey of uh, Electra Green Tech Limited in India. We have started our electric bus division in 2015. And today we have more than 2000 plus electric bus orders on hand. And going forward, these are the products what we have. We have seven meter electric buses, nine meter electric buses, and 12 meter electric buses with longer ranges. Also, we have solutions for intercity operations, apart from city operations, nine meter, 12 meter, and 12 meter coach buses. So these are few buses that we have deployed, different variants deployed across the country for PM, PML, Pune, for Kerala, for Hyderabad, Himachal Pradesh, BST Mumbai. Himachal Pradesh operations are world's largest, like I mean, uh, this is uh, Limka Book of Records. This is a first ever electric bus, which has played at an altitude of 14,000 feet sea level height. Nowhere across the world such kind of operations are happening, I mean, where electric buses are operating currently. So few buses from Silvasa, Nagpur, Surat, Goa, and Dehradun. These are the standard features what we provide in our buses. This is a charging station of uh, Electra Green Tech Limited. Uh, you can see how charging stations are developed. Uh, we were given very, uh, very rustic and I mean, uh, 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 land without having any infrastructure, which we develop to this extent to uh, create a better impression to everybody that we are bringing global standards to the country for the public transportation. So this is our charging station network across the country, wherever we have received orders. So STUs or government agencies will give us the space to develop charging stations workshops within the depot premises itself, where we will develop the charging stations 
and we will charge our buses, maintain our buses in that particular charging station or depot itself. So going forward, we have a subsidiary or sister concern, which is called eBay Trans Private Limited, which is India's largest electric bus operator. I request Trans Jakarta also to please note this. Electric buses are capital sensitive, capital intensive. So in case if you really wanted to bring more electric buses to the country, you need to also have an aggregator or operator who will be able to purchase these buses and deploy it with the government agencies. Manufacturer will manufacture the buses, aggregator or operator will, will purchase and deploy and operate the buses for the government agencies. eBay Trans is owning 600 plus electric buses in India and eBay Trans has operated more than five crore kilometer meters on Indian roads. <clears throat> so I uh, request Mr. Sandeep Raizda, who is my counterpart, who takes care of operations uh, for eBay Trans uh, to take this session forward uh, to brief you more effectively on this. Uh, Mr. Sandeep? Yeah, Hello? good morning, everybody. This is Sandeep Rajada. Yeah. We are basically operating the buses, electric buses in India, on behalf of, uh, and we are taking the taking forward the Electra buses, and we are operating at around 42 STUs, as Mr. Vijay has uh, explained the things. For operating, for, op uh, for planning of the operations of buses is, uh, is a different thing. And for planning of electric bus, add some more features. In fact, we have to plan for the locations uh, and very, 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 very uh, uh, theoretically. Basically, it needs uh, in, because the e-bus operation involves heavy power load requirement. So we have to develop our depots where the power is available and where we can operate the buses accordingly. This is the one thing. And uh, since uh, as our uh, Mr. Vikrant all, uh, already uh, explained to this thing, that uh, we, there are restrictions of the range because uh, we, we have to operate, we have to plan the routes, etc. depending upon the range of the bus and the availability because uh, after every uh, this charging is required. So we, we need to plan depots accordingly as per the requirement of load and the charging and the route uh, formulation has to be done on the that basis. We in India, we are operating more, uh, around 300 buses in Pune right now, and we have crossed 20 million kilometers in uh, one city. This is again a record for the uh, this uh, sub-region. So for the planning of uh, operation, we have to we have to consider the charging charging philosophy also whether we are going for the slow charging or the fast charging or the combination of these basically the load is available um, load is available in the night time so we go for the uh, slow charging that is the ac charging we used to keep it uh, we charge the most of the buses in the night time and uh, for the whole operation of 60 about uh, in India, for city bus operations is uh, ranges for about 16 hours. So we need to uh, we need to charge inter for the go for the intermediate charging also. On that time we we have to put up these uh, fast chargers so that we can achieve our requirement of range of kilometers. And their combination is to be there so that the these schedules are to be developed accordingly cons considering the charging time in between also and but we cannot we cannot focus on the charging time because the, our prime duty is to pro provide the buses as per the requirement of passengers so we have to adjust the charging in intermediate charging in between the these schedules so this is the major thing and uh, for this thing, we can go for the battery sizes also. We can go on increasing the battery, battery sizes. But in every country, there are some uh, statutory requirements of this, uh, of the weight of the vehicle. Uh, ultimately, 
we have to make a optim we have to uh, optimize the combination of these things basically uh, to complete the uh, to have the bus body weight is there and we if we increase the battery size to get the range to increase the range then we will compromise with the passenger load payload capacity so ultimately we have to optimize for this so that the we can get the optimum pay, uh, payload facility is in the bus so the, uh, to get the maximum opportunity of this and the battery life cycle and uh, this is the major thing the climate energy of ac in india we are having a extreme sort of uh, extreme uh, winter and extreme uh, these uh, summers also the temperature ranges from uh, 5 degree to uh, 46 to 50 degree centigrade and we are operating in different conditions and different op uh, operations we are organizing in india and this is a major challenge to operate in such a wide uh, range of kilometer range of temperature this is the basically for the for electric bus this high initial cost uh, high initial cost is there so capex is high but to consider but we can when we compare it with the ic engine cycle the total cost of operation goes down for these electric buses this is because and to achieve this to achieve lo lower tco we have to have the more kilometer operated in the in a day unless we operate the more kilometer we cannot achieve the tco so for this planning part comes very very important in the in the electric bus operation so that we can plan we can utilize max the resource, our resources to the max and these things are basically interlinked with all these things so ultimately there are solutions that we eliminate between we eliminate we reduce the charging time as soon as much as we can between the scheduled time Mr. Vijay Kumar, your remaining time is five minutes. Thank you. So, for to meet the, these challenges, cost of operation increases the viability. In fact, the, in India, there, there is again one thing: for the city bus operation, there is always a viability gap. This viability gap comes about the for the operations or operation cost and the whatever we receive uh, through fare box revenues. This, this, is a, this is a big challenge for any operator around the world. We, we, we should get them some subsidy from the government or the funds requirement is there. Ultimately, whenever we, we produce a project, we produce a product, it should be operative in the market and if we, it should be, I mean, uh, it should be supported by the finance and all. For this, a, a very good, well thought viability gap funding should be there in place to uh, to run the show so for this uh, in uh, in fact in india there is a there is going on uh, some sort of models and the uh, very good gcc model gross cost, cost contract model is there and which involves the operators and the manufacturers also because being a new technology there is always a teething problem so uh, when the manufacturer is al also a part of the game there are these things we can sail through and we can we can establish a very good operation network in any country uh, for this uh, there is a basically this is a cost inten uh, in intensive thing so the contract period uh, uh, should be higher what we propose it should be uh, 16 kilo 16 years basically in ev the the best thing is the most of the i mean the moving parts we have, we have reduced so we, we, we just have a chassis and the electric motors. So we don't have that cumbersome engine, IC, what we, we used to have in the IC engine and different things. So we have reduced those. So our life of the bus can be improved and we can go for the operations up to 16 years. And there are many features and to increase the, uh, to add on for the fare box revenues also. The advertisement revenues are there the longer routes we, we can plan and the all the longer routes and the low total longer i mean the longer schedule for the day uh, is Mr. To Kumar, and, your remaining time is three minutes yeah and uh, yeah. we have to Thank reduce 
we have to reduce basically the downtime and this is good in ev that generally the other parts since we have removed the ic engine we have removed the transmission and all so downtime is down for these buses and the maintenance of these buses is very easy and uh, very convenient for the operations yeah i think uh, this is the right time thank you and if there is any question we can, we can you can take forward thank you so much sir thank you mr uh, sandeep yeah sir uh, we are open for any questions here and lastly i wanted to uh, mention one two things i mean in a whole to summarize i request you people uh, to strategize it in such a way have at least 100 buses in a depot each depot will have different kind of each bus will operate some buses will operate for 250 km some may operate 100 km some may operate 150 km we suggest you to prefer night time charging with which the grid can be stabilized whatever power is generated in the country in indonesia that will be fully utilized in the day time because everybody will be working and households will be working in the house and that power will be consumed totally when it comes to night time whatever power is generated cannot be fully utilized with which there is a grid impact also is there so we can use electric buses as a battery uh, as an energy storage device so that the power can be stored in the buses in the night time and vehicle should operate in the morning time so that both solutions are taken care of this is what is our idea and suggestion and we are very effectively we are able to very effectively implement this strategy varakra uh, runs its buses with longer range only so we are open for any questions uh, sara here yes. thank you thank you very much uh, and yes we are open to questions thank you uh, mr fijay and also mr sandeep for the presentation and ladies and gentlemen we will begin our first question and answer session our first discussion session this morning and therefore i would like to please invite the speakers and also the presenters of the first two presentation to please appear once again on screen to mr vikrant vaidya to mr fijay kumar and also mr sandeep to please be present to be able to answer the questions from the participants and to all yeah. of you participants we would like Sarka, to also yes uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you uh, in the interest of time uh, there is a question posted to me uh, by one of our colleague how long the operation of contract of eu buses in india right now what is the tenure of contract yes it is it is there is a think tank of in india which is called niti ayog who has already defined life of contract of electric buses in india will be around 16 years however majority of the stus are taking 12 to 10 years 10 to 12 years time but we can go ahead up to 16 years because in diesel buses what happens i'll explain you in diesel buses because of the vibrations that the bus generates i see engines generates the bus body and all other components life will be deteriorated whereas in electric vehicles there is no such uh, vibrations harshness generated in the buses with which the life of the bus will increase and one beauty of electric vehicles is that if your motor time life is over you can replace a new motor when it comes to ic engines ic engine beyond a point of time cannot perform so you have to replace the engine which is a costly affair so electric buses i suggest in indonesia to kindly go for longer tenure contract periods with which it will be more feasible and more viable for the country okay thank you and there's an just to save time there is another question a follow up question of follow up as well yeah, yeah uh, this is uh, i believe that it is about how long the leasing company can support the credit for ev buses yes this is a good question Uh, we have incorporated eva trans private limited which leases which owns or which uh, provides the buses and hiring uh, uh, to the government agencies for the entire contract period they will handle this business on their own so leasing will happen for 12 years up to 12 years it can be provided all right thank you very much uh, for answering uh, straight away that saves so much time thank you mr vijay for uh, the answer and once again to all the participants if you have a question please do type them in the chat box and we will read them 
to the speaker or the panelists regarding your questions. State your name and also your institution as well. And before we continue with the questions from the participants, I would like to now ask uh, Mr. Vaidya or Mr. Vikrant Vaidya. And, and I would like to know further or probably push on the considerations, especially for the eBus operators to select the most sustainable battery chemical and technology for eBus, especially for the operators here in Indonesia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the selection of uh, both the technology or, or the subchemistry as well as uh, the size of the battery, uh, it uh, should be driven by, uh, by uh, what exactly is the requirement for those routes. Uh, uh, of course, it, it doesn't make sense to have different buses and different uh, chemistries or different batteries uh, uh, for different routes on, on a given, uh, uh, in a given city, so to speak. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we do have examples of uh, this happening, uh, uh, at least uh, uh, in Shenzhen, China, where uh, you have, although two manufacturers, but uh, they are working with uh, close to 15 different models of buses, uh, different sizes, as well as same size, uh, different uh, uh, batteries, uh, battery sizes. Um, and there is a minimum battery size defined uh, by, uh, by the local authorities. Uh, but even though uh, that has been done, there have been different battery sizes. So uh, it, it is a combination of, uh, as I said, uh, the, the battery size and the charging availability that defines the overall feasibility and the right combination uh, is to be chosen so that you don't actually go for too big a battery because big, the bigger the battery, as uh, Mr. Sandeep also mentioned, it eats up your passenger space uh, it, it, it's up eventually your revenue uh, potential. Uh, at the same time, too small a battery doesn't enable uh, some of the routes uh, which may have high ridership. So uh, uh, we have to find a way in which uh, you, you can have some opportunity charging, which by the way does help uh, with the battery life as well. You do not want your batteries to drain down all the way and then charge all the way up. It takes more time. Uh, it it uh, actually generates more heat as well as it, it, uh, uh, it, it uh, actually lowers your battery life. Uh, if you do uh, keep charging uh, from uh, a smaller window of uh, state of charge, it actually is good for the battery life as well. So uh, it's, it's a very case-to-case uh, -case basis analysis which should be done, uh, uh, at least the initial deployment where uh, we do this analysis, deploy uh, knowing the risks at least, and then uh, uh, through the operations we learn and apply those learnings to the, the, the ramp up. All right, thank you for the answer. And uh, Mr. Vaidya, it appears there is a question here from the participants that is addressed to you uh, from MAB Purianto regarding the infrastructure of charging station in India. Uh, is there any support from the central government or local government? And what kind of support uh, is needed to speed up the electrification of public transport. Yeah, uh, there there has been uh, uh, a provision. There there has been a policy uh, uh, in under which both the electric buses as well as charging infrastructure is subsidized um, uh, by the government, um, uh, particularly for the public transport buses, uh, but also a few other type of vehicles, um, uh, and in that. Uh, the, the subsidy for the charging itself, the charger and the charging infrastructure itself can go even up to 100%, but it's being approved on a case-to-case -case basis. Um, uh, apart from that, uh, there are multiple models coming in, uh, particularly uh, uh, which are favorable for public transport, which is uh, uh, more, as, as uh, uh, the previous speakers also mentioned, they are currently more in a GCC or gross cost contract kind of models. Uh, the, the charging as a service model, uh, which is being explored in multiple cities in India, where uh, the, the charger stay on the book of the charging service provider. Uh, they just bill you uh, for their assets in addition to the electricity. So uh, those kind of models are also being encouraged uh, where uh, uh, each, of, uh, each of the area of expertise, if I may call them, is dealt by uh, those particular people rather than 
people with very little knowledge of how to maintain and operate chargers getting into that. All right, thank you, Mr. Vadia. And it appears there is already some questions which is um, proposed for Mr. Vijay Kumar uh, in the chat box, but it appears that Mr. Vijay has already answered them through the chat box. Probably I can help by reading the questions and also answer for the other participants. Uh, the question is from Mr. Purianto, um, asking Mr. Vijay Mediconda, uh, how long of the operation contract of EV, EV bus in India right now? Are there any national regulation related to the term of the contract? And it has been answered. And in the chat box, Mr. Uh, Vijay has already answered as well, 16 years. And Mr. Purianto has also asked, and then how long the leasing company can support the credit of the B, the credit for EV bus and how much gap total costs between electric bus with diesel? What kind of tax incentives are given in India? Uh, the first is uh, one CRINR subsidy is given by the Indian government. And it depends upon the per day coverage. We cannot standardize it. In India, we have bus operations ranging from 150 kilometers to 400 kilometer city operations. And now the Indian government is providing 55, 55 million subsidy for each bus. No, no, 5.5 uh, 5 million, Sarah, sorry to interrupt. It's 5.5 yes. 5 million. Oh, okay, five point five. Please Indian do rupees, yeah. please uh, please answer. Um, please do answer for us and please explain to us because uh, I'm afraid if there are any typos in the chat box. Please do. No, Mr. no, yeah. no issue. Thank you. Uh, initially, when we have a, a fame scheme, faster adoption of manufacturing of electric vehicles in India, faster adoption of manufacturing of electric vehicles in India, there was a scheme launched by. Government of India in 2016 onwards. In, in, in the initial phases of this particular scheme, Government of India has offered uh, 10 million Indian uh, currency for each bus as a capital subsidy. Now, after that, we with, we with that support, we were able to deploy some buses and then Government of India started reducing the subsidy slowly. Now, currently, Government of India is offering 5.5 million Indian, Indian currency as a capital subsidy for each bus. This is a central government support. Now, various states are giving various other benefits also. Local states, local state governments are offering uh, uh, no registration required for electric buses, no permits required for electric buses. And, and they have reduced, they have released electric vehicle policies across the country, all state governments in which they have offered exemption for toll toll taxes and then a very 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 minimal uh, energy cost for electric vehicles per unit per kilowatt hour kind of energy consumption the cost is uh, ranging in india is around four rupees to eight rupees some state governments are offering it four rupees indian currency and some state governments are offering it eight to ten rupees so these are the policies and initiatives taken by the by the country whole country with which today today our country is going to become uh, very shortly like i mean we'll be able to touch the point of world's largest electric electric bus fleet in any uh, country compared to i mean global global comparison uh, this is it from my side with respect to the incentives all right, thank you very much for answering the question and explaining it to us, Mr. Uh, Vijay. And now next, we will also like to ask um, Mr. Vijay Kumar and push on exactly the considerations for the e-bus drivers to consume the less our lesser batteries since it can or it could reduce the battery consumption by around 40%. Can you please um, also explain to us regarding the considerations? Can you please repeat the question? I, I couldn't understand the question. Uh, what are the considerations for the e-bus drivers to consume the lesser battery since because it could reduce the battery consumption by 40%? See, so it involves training. Uh, our drivers are required to be trained properly, not to over accelerate the vehicle. That is one basic question, right? Basic requirement, not to over accelerate the bus. And the second uh, basic theory is that 
whenever there is a need to stop the vehicle he has to stop accelerating two basic things there is nothing else i i, I even i have driven the bus some of our female uh, uh, we have female drivers also who are operating our buses driving our buses it is very simple very easy there is no rocket science involved in electric buses at least when it comes to operations so these are the two basic things are if you want us uh, to help you we can provide you some driver training uh, uh, driver training materials to indonesia trans jakarta so that they can implement it in uh, uh, in the jakarta also we will provide you that material in detail all right all right thank you very much and now there is uh, another question here from our participants from um, mr andrew hartono and probably both um, Vijay and Vikrant, please do answer the yeah. question that is proposed. Maybe we can start from uh, Mr. Uh, Vadia first. The question proposed is, what is the main technical problem during e-bus operation in India? And how long the battery cycle used in India or when can it or when will it need to be replaced? Probably, um, Vikrant, you may answer first. Yeah, sure. Uh, so a uh, few of the uh, uh, repeating problems, I would say, uh, that we saw in the initial deployment was uh, uh, the, the availability of uh, energy for or power for charging. Uh, although the, the, the connections were uh, requested and taken, um, one uh, instance I remember where uh, we had uh, power uh, cuts during uh, a certain weekday uh, because the, the line which was providing the power to the depot was uh, actually also catering to an industrial area which uh, had a weekly shutdown on that day. So uh, that uh, did not mean that the bus services uh, would also shut down, but uh, the, the charging infrastructure uh, could not be powered because of these power cuts. Uh, so uh, it, is, it is important uh, to understand uh, 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 that uh, it's, it's not just about having the connection and having the power availability. The power availability should also be reliable uh, because even one day uh, uh, a power cut during particularly uh, the period where you have scheduled charging can disrupt the entire schedule. Uh, another problem that we usually see uh, is uh, uh, the underestimation of the energy required. Uh, there was one deployment in one of the cities which uh, also went for uh, a smaller size swappable battery uh, for their uh, BRT system. And they had to roll back uh, and come to a, a, a fixed battery solution because uh, the energy that was estimated uh, for even uh, uh, the trip between two swaps was uh, more than uh, what was anticipated. So these two are... Uh, uh, I would say the primary problems that we have seen, uh, maybe uh, uh, Vijay can add to that. Uh, he also has a lot of experience in, in the deployments. All right, thank you, uh, Vikram, for your answer. And Vijay, what are your views regarding the question from uh, Andrew Hartono regarding the technical problem or the main technical problem during EBUS operation and about the battery cycle used? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Vikrant has already briefed it. However, uh, we would wanted to em emphasize on the requirement of battery range capacity. Uh, majorly in India, many of the OEMs have deployed and delivered the buses, which could not attain the range requirement of a bus. So we suggest you to go for longer range buses with which your operations will not be hampered, more availability of fleet for the public transport, and you don't need to charge it in the daytime if you charge your bus in daytime, your power cost will be higher. In India, daytime power consumption cost is higher if you consume the power on daytime. Nighttime, there is a subsidy of one to two rupees in India. So EV policy defines all these things. So we suggest you to go for a longer range bus with which you can charge it in the nighttime, use it in the daytime. That's a good solution, at least for public transport. All right. Thank you very much, Vijay, for your answer. And thank you, Vikrant, as well, for answering the question and answer session. Thank you for taking part in the discussion. And thank you, Vijay and Vikrant, for your presentations and sharing your insights with us as well.
And now, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, was the end of our first question and answer session, or our first discussion session. And now we will proceed to the next presentation for our webinar this morning. And the next presentation will be presented by Mr. Sutan Upati of the ITDP Finance Consultant. And he will be presenting on the topic of global new business models and financing mechanism for EBUS procurement. And without further ado, I would like to pass the screen over to Mr. Patti. And Mr. Patti, I would like to also remind you that your presentation time is 15 minutes. Mr. Patti, uh, I'm afraid we are unable to hear your voice. You may start once again. It appears we are facing some technical or audio issues with Mr. Patti, and we are trying to reconnect once again through the audio of Mr. Patti will present to us the global new business models and financing mechanism for EBUS procurement. And as we wait for the technical issues to be resolved. Hello. Hello. Okay, great. Mr. Pati, yes, we can hear you now. Thank you very much for joining us from another device for the audio. So please, you may start and proceed okay. with your presentation. Next slide, please. So first of all, we'd like to <clears throat> understand uh, the differences between the diesel and electric buses in terms of financing. And before that, we let's understand what are the differences between the, these two types of buses. So first of all, the diesel buses cost a lot lower than the electric buses. The technology for diesel is well established, but for the electric buses, it is still evolving. And there are uh, many variations in terms of uh, the type of battery, the type of charging, the uh, range of the vehicles and, and um, acceleration that the bus can have. So all those variations are still settling in. The main source of funding for diesel buses has been the um, banks, the government grants and the asset financing companies. Whereas for electric buses, we see the banks are not forthcoming to finance them. So we have to mainly rely on government grants, the manufacturers coming forward to finance these buses, green funds, or even the overshield, um, overseas development assistance from uh, uh, KFW and, and similar organizations. In terms of the resale market or the reuse of the buses, for diesel buses, it is very well established, but for electric buses, we still have to reach that stage and it is currently non-existent. The life of the bus in terms of uh, running, it could be up to 1 million kilometer for each of the diesel and electric buses. But in terms of uh, number of years, uh, we think, Diesel buses last about 10 years, but electric buses can last up to 15 years. So therefore, the loan term for diesel buses is typically lower, uh, five years. But for electric buses, the loan term needed is more than eight to 10 years uh, so that the annual installments can be uh, you know, um, uh, reasonable. In terms of other investments for diesel buses, the maintenance depot is the only thing that is needed. And uh, that too, it need not hold all the buses at the same time. So the depot size can be much smaller uh, and the buses can be parked elsewhere. But for electric buses, which are primarily uh, uh, going for overnight charging, so we need uh, the charging uh, the, and, and maintenance space for almost all the electric buses. Uh, and, and therefore the depot requirement is quite uh, more than the diesel buses. Also, there could be instances where opportunity charging will be required. So you need additional infrastructure for that as well. And we need grid connection for the charging facilities. So these are the additional investments that are required for electric buses. The major maintenance, uh, uh, as mentioned by Mr. Bijay Kumar, is the engine replacement for diesel buses. But electric buses, it could be battery replacement and uh, the change of the motors. The operating cost for diesel buses is mostly semi-variable or uh, completely variable based on the running. 
but for the electric buses it's mainly fixed cost in terms of the um, uh, repaying the debt that is taken or, or servicing the capital and some semi variable costs the diesel buses have a lot of flexibility in terms of operations but the electric buses have to be operated for the system that they have been designed and there is very limited flexibility and as of now in the indonesian context the import dependence is very low for diesel buses but for electric buses uh, a large portion of the um, bus has to be uh, imported if not the uh, entire bus next slide please so if we look at the funding sources for the diesel buses almost 10% can come from the scrap value of the old vehicle another 10% from uh, the equity of the operator and up to 80% uh, one can avail from uh, loan or or debt financing but when we look at electric buses so we will be scrapping the same diesel vehicle so this in terms of amount the scrapping value will be the same but in terms of percentage it is much lower because the electric bus costs uh, uh, much more than the diesel bus and the amount of debt available is typically seen to be lower for electric buses so the remaining amount has to come from equity so if you see uh, as against 10% of the bus cost being net financed by the equity for the electric bus it has to be almost 46 to 50% now in terms of amounts next slide please so in terms of amounts we see the scrap value is same because we are scrapping the same old diesel vehicle and in terms of debt we see higher debt being available for the electric vehicle but if you compare the equity requirement from the operator it is almost 10 to 12 times uh, for the electric bus as compared to the diesel bus so this is an important consideration when we are looking at financing models and so we can very easily say that the traditional financing models for diesel buses is not going to work for electric buses next slide please so what are the differences so as i mentioned for diesel buses very little infrastructure cost so it's mostly the cost of the bus but for electric bus the bare cost of the bus itself is more than the diesel bus then there is an additional component for the battery and then there is an additional component for the uh, infrastructure now we can uh, reduce the size of the problem by removing the financing of the battery and the charging infrastructure uh, from the financing of the bus so if you see uh the difference between the diesel and electric bus can be reduced substantially if we can separate out the ownership of the battery and the charging infrastructure next slide so this graph shows the amount of financing that transjakarta itself will need to replace uh, or, or to have the entire fleet of large and medium electric buses by 2030 so we see that the total investment requirement is almost 3 billion dollars and the annual investments can be you know almost touching um, half a billion dollars uh, on a year end basis now if we see that uh, or if we recall that the equity investment can be up to 50% of this so this presents uh, an almost impossible scenario uh, for this financing to take place using the traditional models of course next slide please so then we now look at some of the alternate business models now given the limitation of time i am not covering all uh the different models that are being tried out all over the country especially um my fellow speaker miss macedo will be covering the business models uh, uh that are adopted in uh, latin america so we we look at some of the other business models so uh, we start with the first one which is the pay as you save model or the pays model so in this case uh, what is advocated is that the utility Uh, the electricity company comes forward and finance the battery and the charging infrastructure so that way like i was mentioning the overall capital requirement is reduced to a great extent the cost of the bus is uh, almost same as the cost of the diesel bus and therefore the bus provider can follow the traditional methods of financing uh, the uh, electric bus as they would do for the diesel bus so in this case what is happening for the utility which may have a very good financial strength uh so they are using their financial financing capacity to finance part of the uh funding requirements at a much lower cost and also they are assuring themselves a new source of revenue for charging the battery buses so without owning the bus itself because they can uh, control the charging and they can control uh the use of the asset they are actually controlling the asset so they don't have to own the bus but they're still controlling the bus so this is a very good model where the utility companies are willing and able to finance 
the uh, battery and the charging infrastructure it is something related to their area of operation and also they are um, they are uh, utilizing uh, their own uh, capital assets and the most important thing is the second life of the battery after the battery uh, has has been used for seven eight years when it needs to be replaced it can still be used for energy storage purposes so if we consider uh, 1000 buses uh, with with let's say 300 kilowatt hour batteries then after eight years uh, in a city like trans they can have almost uh, 100 um, gigawatt hours sorry 300 gigawatt hours of uh, storage capacity and if you divide it by two or three hours of peak uh, peak time then they can get up to 150 megawatt of additional source of energy. And for a city of Jakarta, that is used and, and the cost of energy can be reduced for everybody. So next slide, please. So a similar model uh, was used in China. This is the second phase for Shenzhen. But in the first phase, they were using a similar model to the PACE model where the uh, another government owned company was providing the battery and the charging infrastructure. And not only that, they also provided guarantee to the lessor for the uh, payment of the lease rentals by the uh, bus company. Now, in this new model, uh, here the national government is subsidizing the cost of production, so the cost of the bus comes down. They are also providing operating subsidy to the bus operating company and also charging subsidy to the charging service provider. So overall, the cost of running the uh, electric bus comes down. The e-bus manufacturer sells the bus to the leasing company. And then the leasing company uh, makes available the bus to the bus operating companies uh, and who pay the lease rent, uh, which may be higher than the debt that they were uh, servicing for the diesel bus. But considering the overall uh, uh, cost of running the bus is much lower for the electric bus, this still works out to be a net saving uh, for the bus operating company and therefore they are able to save from the very first day. So instead of the e-bus costing more, it actually ends up costing less for the bus operating company using this leasing model. Mr. Pati, your remaining time is five minutes. Thank you. Next slide, please. So we see. We see a project finance model. Uh, this has been used in India. This is for an intercity uh, project where the daily operation was 600 kilometers and the size of the fleet is uh, 48 buses with five spare buses. And because of the high usage, the uh, cost of operations was almost uh, 10,000 rupiah per kilometer. Now for Trans Jakarta, we did this exercise. I think it was more than twice this amount because the average running was about 180 or 200 kilometers. But because of the heavy running here, the cost of the uh, running was almost 10,000 uh, rupiah per kilometer. And here the project financing structure was used. Uh, there was an escrow account that the uh, bus authority opened where they deposited three months worth of revenue into the account from the beginning itself. And all the ticket sales were deposited into that bank account. And that is enough to pay for the running cost uh, for the bus company. So here the debt amount uh, available for financing was 57% and the equity was 43%. So this shows that, uh, you know, um, a project finance structure can also be applied for financing electric buses. But there are certain things that are required from the government side. Like in this case, there was an escrow account, uh, which was opened. Uh, a subsidy of 1 billion rupiah per bus was made available from the national government, uh, cost over and support from the sponsors. So these uh, little things are available from, uh, or needs to be make, made available from the national government and the uh, bus authority for uh, a project finance scheme to be successful. Next slide, please. So another interesting development that is taking place currently is that uh, five cities in India have uh, collectively uh, decided to go for a, uh, a joint procurement. So in this five cities have added their requirements and the total number of buses that are being procured is 5,585 with a total amount of financing required of $1.1 billion US. So how is this going to be financed then? So part of this funding is for coming from the national subsidy of almost $250 million. So that's almost 25% of the uh, task reduced. Then the um, provincial governments have also come forward to offer additional subsidy 
uh, for their city uh, governments. Then there is an expectation that the cost will reduce because of this large uh, procurement that is going on. And therefore the operator will have to now fund uh, almost 50% of the total cost if, uh, if the state subsidy and, and the cost reduction can amount to almost $300 million, then the operator is reduced, uh, the, the task for the operator is reduced uh, by 50%. Next slide. So interestingly, there is a, a formula for the cost reduction in this tender. So for every 20 million uh, in, uh, Indonesian rupiah of additional subsidy that the uh, regional governments provide, the price per kilometer will be reduced by 50 IDR per kilometer. So over 12 years, assuming 66,000 kilometers per year, this can work out to an IRR of 12.5% for the state government. Now, the state government can borrow funds at much, much lesser cost, like 5 or 6%. So therefore, it's a very um, lucrative proposal for them to provide the subsidy. On the other hand, on a post-tax basis, the operator's uh, cost of funds for this subsidy will be only 5.7%. So therefore, they, are, uh, they will also be happy to avail this subsidy because uh, you know, this, this amount that they're financing at a post-tax cost of 6% only. So uh, this is overall an win-win situation. Next slide, please. So based on this, we proposed a model for Trans Jakarta, and this can easily be adopted for uh, other cities also. Of course, I must um, uh, mention that there is, no there is no final decision has been taken on this by Trans Jakarta, but this is the model we suggested. So here we talk about three different contracts that Trans Jakarta can enter into. The first contract will be with the charging company, where they, Trans Jakarta will ensure that they will get paid whether the buses are charged or not. So the charging company is assured of their revenue or the fixed costs uh, that they will be incurring in uh, setting up and running the uh, charging infrastructure. The operator uh, will have a contract with Trans Jakarta for operating the buses and they will pay to the charging company for the amount of energy that they use. Similarly, there will be another contract uh, for the leasing of the buses between the lessor and the operator. And at the Mr. same time, Trans Jakarta will also ensure to the lessor that they will be using the buses from the yes. operator so that the lessor, yes. when they buy the buses, they're assured of uh, the usage of the buses. And also in case the operator defaults, you know, there could be a substitution of the operator and so that the lessor is always assured that the buses will get utilized. The lessor in turn will have a contract with the OEMs and the APMs for uh, purchasing the buses and maintaining the buses. So in this way, Trans Jakarta has to play a more, much more active role as compared to the current uh, by the service contracts where they just have one contract with the operator and the operator is supposed to take care of every aspect of it. But in this case, Trans Jakarta will have to have separate agreements with the charging company, with the operator, with the lessor. And uh, that way assuring everyone of uh, usage of their assets and the overall financing that can come from uh, debt will be much higher in this case so the operator will be required to finance or arrange uh, minimum financing. And with this, we can uh, hope that the scaling up that Trans Jakarta is, is uh, planning can be achieved. Next slide, please. So overall, we see that the requirement for financing the uh, e-bus and the infrastructure is huge. The operator's financing capacity is inadequate. And therefore, separation of the ownership and the operations is a must. The economy of scale can be achieved by higher volumes. So uh, cities like Jakarta and other Bandung and other cities can come together and, and have a joint procurement to achieve uh, more volumes and, and lesser cost. And there is a commitment that is required from the regional and national governments for a definite rollout plan for the e-buses, phasing out of the diesel buses. There should be budgetary support uh, uh, like we uh, see in case of India, almost one billion dollar, one sorry, one billion rupiah is being made available for each uh, twelve meter bus. So there is a policy support that is needed, and there is an implementation framework support that is also needed because there will be land requirement, there will be electricity requirement uh, from uh, support from the environment, support from the customer uh, consumer. So all all support and also uh, above all support from the operators who are going to uh, operate these buses. So all this support is required. And with this, uh, we hope that Indonesia can learn from the implementation in the other countries uh, like China and India and, and uh, have a rapid rollout of the electric buses. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions and suggestions. 
And thank you, Mr. Sutanupati, for uh, your presentation. And ladies and gentlemen, yes, we will be looking forward to your questions, which will be presented or asked to our presenters during the question and answer session. Please do write them in the chat box available, stating your name and also your institution. All right, we will continue to our next presentation which will be presented by Ms. Bianca Makedo, the Investment and Partnership Manager for the Zebra Project at C40. And she will be presenting the business model and financing mechanism for BEV deployment with a study case in Latin America. So without further ado, I will present the screen to Ms. Bianca Makedo and your presentation time is 15 minutes. Okay, thank you, thank you for can you hear me? Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm Bianca Macedo, I'm Investment and Partnership Manager at the Zebra Project, which means Zero Emission Bus Rapid Deployment Accelerator. Uh, and now I'm going to present to you some innovative business models that have been developed in Brazil and Latin America uh, for deployment, accelerated deployment of e-buses. Uh, I'm, I'm talking from Brazil. You can go uh, at the slide. So uh, as has been discussed in this event today, uh, one of the High, one of the biggest challenges that we have for EBUS deployments, together with much other challenges such as technology risk, operational risk, charging infrastructure and others, is the high upfront costs. And this presentation today is, is about how we, with innovative business models, just as was presented uh, now uh, in, my, in the previous presentation, how can we address this challenge? You can pass. So, uh, uh, although it's a very important challenge, the high upfront capital costs for the, the e bus, uh, still they can have lower TCO, which means that if we sum for the lifetime of the, the bus, uh, if we sum capital cost, maintenance, and operation, in the end, it can be effective. It can be cost effective. So, uh, generally, in Latin American cities, what we have is that uh, the total cost of ownership for the e-bus is lower than the total cost of ownership for the diesel bus. So that's why we should uh, start and accelerate the, this transition the sooner the possible. You can go. So this transition is already underway in Latin America and is very accelerated. So now we have 2,800 e-buses. We have this platform called ebusradar.org where we always keep it updated how, how many e-buses we have in the region. And the leading cities are Santiago and Bogota with hundreds and hundreds of e-buses and, and many more to come. And we already have 30 Latin American cities uh, that started this transition, you can go. So how, how do we start? Where can we start? You can pass. Uh, so the way to start, uh, we believe it with innovative business models for e-bus deployments, which I'm going to explain. First, uh, we need to explain how the model uh, is nowadays. So how is the transit business model in, uh, in Brazil? So first we start that, the, the transit system is paid basically by passengers that pay the system by user fares. And depending on the city, we can have subsidies from the municipality. And most of the activities in the transit system are, uh, are all concentrated in one operator. This operator is generally private. There are some cities that they can be public, such as the municipality itself, but generally it's a private operator that has to procure the vehicles, finance, own the vehicles, operate, maintain, 
and do what's needed in the end of the life. So that, uh, and this operator has to lead uh, with commercial lenders or concessional lenders and buy everything he needs uh, to uh, operate the, the public transport. You can go. So you can go more. And you can go more and more because, yeah. Now, yeah, okay. So this model has a very unfavorable risk allocation because we have a lot of, of the, the responsibilities in the system laid in one only entity. And then all the these risks that we, these challenges and these risks for a bus deployment rely on this only one entity. And that's a problem because you can pass. That's a problem because these um, organizations or entity, you can pass, thank you. And they are not well equipped to manage all these risks. So even if it's the municipality, the operator in, in smaller cases, but major, if we have a private operator, uh, most it can be that they, it has difficulties to access capital. It cannot. It can be that it's not credit worthy. It's a private company, uh, so it has problems. Uh, can be small. It has a lack of transparency depending on the city. So uh, it's it's very it's very difficult that this operator will be able to face the high upfront costs and get the financing for the transition. You can pass. So what we are seeing and what we are proposing, just as we saw in the latest presentation, is a separation of operation and all the other responsibilities in the system. So uh, what we have now is a separating or unbundling the model where we leave the operation with the operator and uh, there is a new entity that enters the system uh, and is the asset owner. Most of the times it is a utility company and, it's, and this company as an investor is also willing to buy the buses. It can be the buses in the charging infrastructure or the buses in the battery or only the buses or only the charging infrastructure. But that's why we said asset because it's uh, part of the assets of the system. And this company is willing to buy these assets and, and make these assets available through a leasing to the operator or to the municipality. You can pass. So uh, this is the transit model nowadays. You can pass. And this is how uh, the new model would look like. So what changed is that there is this new asset owner and the asset owner now will have a leasing contract with the operator and this operator will pay a leasing payment uh, for this asset owner. And, and the responsibilities now are split and the operator is with what uh, he knows best, which is to operate. And the asset owner is uh, going to invest in the high capital costs that we need for the transition and make it this available through a leasing payment. You can go. This model has been spread in many cities and has allowed for the transition in leading cities such as Santiago. So this is the Metbus model. Metbus is one operator in Santiago, one of the with the biggest fleet in of EPAS. You can pass, and uh, this is the model they use. It's very similar to the one I just explained to you. Uh, so we have. Uh, the difference is that the municipality now uh, uh, has an operation payment for the operator and uh, it, it pays the leasing payment. So they implement in just a little change. You can see that there is the leasing contract between the asset owner, which is NLX, and the private operator, which is Metbus. But they implemented a plus, they implemented a, a improvement in the model, which is the payment is not paid anymore by the operator. The payment is made through the municipality. And this is a very good way of improving this model because when NLX or an asset owner investor enters the system, uh, it, it has a lot of risk to have a contract and a payment from an operator. 
because of the problems I said just in the beginning. It can be that the operator is not credit worthy. It can be that the, the, the revenues of the system, the, the passengers' uh, revenues go down and then they don't pay, or this, the company enters into failure. So because of this higher risk, then NLX or any asset owner will put a higher price for for the leasing contract. And if this payment is made through the municipality, then an asset owner will have more guarantees and lower risk, and this will allow for lower leasing payments. So that's one way to improve this model. And so uh, the, the model when we have payments and leasing contract between operator and asset owner, let's say that the first step, the first possible way without many changes or institu institutional changes. But this model has many opportunities for uh, improvement. So I will, I will tell them now, you can pass. So the first uh, bottleneck or challenge of that can be improved is that the user fares from the passengers are a risk. If uh, we have this payment directly to the operator, then the problem is that the operator concentrates the risk of the demand. If the demand goes down, just as happened in COVID, then it's the operator that has this risk. You can go. Also, if the subsidies from the municipality are paid by passengers, then and there's also the risk of the revenues uh, by the passengers going down, the number of passengers going down, and then the payments from the municipality going down because the payment is made per passenger, but the private operator still had the same more or less costs to run the system. The kilometers were the same, uh, although there were a lot less uh, passengers, they run the same kilometers. So uh, that's another risk that relies on the operator in this model. You can go. Also, this leasing payment, as we said, from the private operator uh, has some risks related to the credit worthiness of this private company that can be small, that can uh, uh, enter into failure, that can not pay uh, the asset owner and this entire uh, this puts more risk in the project. You can go and the last one is the leasing contract between uh, these private parties. Uh, that also is more risky um, if it's made between them and not considering the municipality as a public uh, a contract that involves a public entity. So you can go. Ms. Macedo, your remaining time is five minutes. Okay, so how can we uh, improve even more this model that is already being used, but we can still improve it to, to allow for lower risks and in, enable much more investment and much more uh, uh, lower risks and more guarantees in this project. So you can go. What we can do firstly is that the municipality uh, has uh, uses an existent or creates a fund where the subsidies that the municipality used to pay goes to this fund together with the passenger fare. So this is centralized in one fare collection system and together with the subsidies, you can pass. Then this payment from the trust fund is split by the to the asset owner. And the, for the asset owner is an availability payment for the e-bus, for the charging infrastructure, for uh, the energy, uh, depending on the case. And uh, also the uh, pays for the operation to the private operator. This operation payment is by kilometer because then there is lower risk for the operator in this case, because what you, what you have is that you are paying for the service it provides. It provides a service that the cost is based on the kilometers run by the bus. So if it runs more kilometers, then you pay accordingly. It doesn't depend on how many uh, passengers entered into the system. You can go. 
and the contracts are directly with the municipality. And this allows for higher guarantees and for this, the, all this project to be more bankable and to attract more investors. So the, the contract can be directly from the asset owner to the municipality and also the operation. We know that this entails in more time consuming contracts because every contract with a municipality is more difficult. So uh, we know that the first model that we presented that has contract between the, pri the private entities is a possible way to start. But if, uh, if, if you think in a longer term, then this would be the ideal model uh, for the transition. You can go. And, and this uh, model allows for a much better allocation of risks between all the parties, the municipality, the operator, the asset owner, and the manuf manufacturers. You can go. You can go. And, and this, uh, sorry, this is an example, the separation of asset ownership or the unbundled model has been replicated all across the region uh, and with uh, very successful models that are escalating along Latin America. You can go. Thank you. Looking forward to answer any question. And thank you as well, Ms. Macedo, for your presentation. And yes, once again, we are looking forward to your questions to all the participants. Please do write your question in the chat box available by stating your name, your institution, and also to whom the question is addressed to. And now we will continue our discussion with the question and answer session or our second discussion session. Therefore, I would like to invite onto the screen once more, Ms. Bianca Macedo and also Mr. Sutanupati to come onto the screen to prepare yourself and help us in answering the questions from the participants. All right, um, now it appears in our chat box, there are a couple of questions that is directed to Mr. Sutanupati. So I will start to uh, ask Mr. Pati, and the question is from Mr. Purianto. As far as you know, is, is there any country or cities which do not have subsidiary for purchasing EV bus, a public transport, and the bus operator can operate smoothly as public service? Please do, Mr. Pati, answer the question from Mr. Purianto for us on the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for relaying the question. <clears throat> yeah, of course, there would be many cities and countries which still do not have uh, the, the subsidies for the e-buses, uh, but it's difficult uh, to have any buses operating without subsidies. As we know, public transport in most uh, countries and cities requires subsidies. Uh, so it's, it's, the, the list may be wrong. I know Indonesia, for example, so, so far doesn't have any subsidy policy for the e-buses. But with proper structuring, maybe even the subsidy is not required. So like Ms. Macedo was uh, presenting, uh, in their country, in, in, uh, or in, in, in Latin America, in some cities like Santiago de Chile, uh, the subsidy requirement came down drastically from, from 50, 60% to about 3% by using the leasing model where the uh, incremental cost of leasing was, uh, was, was less than the, uh, the, the savings from operating electric buses. So with proper financial structuring, the need for subsidies can be reduced to a great extent. So yeah, that's my answer to this question. All right, thank you, Mr. Pati. And next, probably we can also uh, continue the question and answer session to Ms. Macedo as well. Ms. Macedo, can you please uh, tell us uh, more regarding your views, especially um, tell us your findings in the case of Latin America. How many years does it actually take to make the e-bus uh, TCO lower than the diesel buses there, Ms. Macedo? Uh, the, the TCO, we make an evaluation now that is based on a 15 year of lifetime for the EPAS and uh, we can consider a 10, 10 year lifetime for the diesel bus. And now the evaluation when we forecast 
uh, is already the TCO is lower in many cities for the electric. So it's based on the current, uh, but also projected uh, in the current in the net value for today uh, for some cities such as Mexico City, Santiago, Medellin, and the TCO already is lower for the electric. Uh, in some in Brazil, for example, the TCO is still higher a little bit. One challenge that we have in the country is that we have very high import taxes for e-buses and the local industry is not so well developed yet. So the prices are too high for the, the it, it's a red, it, it is a challenge everywhere, but in Brazil, it's even higher the capital cost. So it's a problem. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question or uh, any other thing I missed. Yes. Uh, thank you for the answer. Yes, you have answered it, Ms. Macedo. And next, we will continue to uh, Mr. Pati, to Mr. Supano Pati. There is another question directed to you from our participant, from um, Hendra Puri Masjaya, from Mr. Hendra. Um, the question is, what about the planning or the business planning of e -mo electric uh, vehicles of microtrans and when? There are 6,000 units that uses diesel and pertalite. Isn't this uh, a market opportunity in addition to the neighboring cities of Jakarta? Yeah, thank you for this question. I think uh, it's, it's a very good question and important one that we should not just focus on the large buses, but also on the micro uh, uh, mobility and also on the micro buses. Uh, yes, we did a study for Transjakarta recently for uh, implementation of uh, e-mobility for the micro buses as well. So Transjakarta, as you know, is, is trying to um, include more and more micro buses into their fleet. And by 2030, they expect about 3000 micro buses in their fleet. So yeah, it's an important consideration for them and, and for um, the city. Uh, because this, the last mile connectivity is also important. Uh, the problems that we have for the large e-buses is also the similar problem is for the smaller e-buses. Uh, of course, the availability of uh, suitable models for uh, the anchors or the micro buses right now in Indonesia is an issue. So there is uh, a lot more research uh, that is needed for the suitable models uh, that can be used. The cost of the buses remain higher than the conventional uh, gasoline buses. So we definitely need an alternative financing structure, especially considering that the micro buses are owned by individuals. Uh, as in case of large buses, they are owned by corporations or, or companies, but the micro buses are owned by individuals. So they will have they will find it almost impossible to finance uh, such a higher cost of these buses. So therefore, uh, more or less the structure that we recommended for the large buses can also be looked at for the smaller buses with some variations. The particular problem that we have for micro buses is the unavailability of the depot. Uh, for large buses, to whatever extent the depot is available uh, from, to start with, but for micro buses, there is no depot at all. So for night charging, it is a particular problem for, uh, for these buses. So the charging infrastructure needs to be specially planned, uh, you know, in, at, the, at the terminals or maybe at the shopping malls, which are vacant at night. So those could be used for parking and for charging of these buses. So we definitely need an organized player which can come forward and make available these buses, uh, maybe on hire on a day, on a per day basis or a per month basis to these operators so that they don't have to invest anything. And therefore the transition can be easy on them. So they don't have to really put up a lot of capital and take the risk for the electric buses and their running and spare parts and, and so on and so forth. So therefore definitely an organized player, a third party is needed to procure and finance and maintain these e-buses and the operators could just uh, then operate these buses. And like uh, Mr. Vijay Kumar suggested, the, it is very easy to uh, operate the electric buses so, or electric vehicles. So it's, it's not a problem at all. So financing seems to be the key problem here and also charging and, and the depot space for, for the uh, micro buses. And like I said, there, there could be many avenues like stadiums or schools or, or shopping malls and, and parking lots, which could be used at night for charging these buses. And therefore there needs to be a policy and a consultation that is needed. And we definitely need a framework where a third party can come in and finance these vehicles. And they need to be given assurance that their investment is not going to 
uh, remain unutilized. So uh, entities like Trans Jakarta will have to have a side agreement with them for utilization of their assets. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Fati. And now we will continue the question and answer session to Ms. Macedo again. Ms. Macedo, can you please also uh, explain to us regarding the biggest challenges uh, on shifting from bundled to unbundled model in many Latin American countries that we can learn from? Well, um, one challenge that we are facing now, even for, let's say, the easier model, which is still with the private operators uh, working with the asset owner uh, between them. I mean, to, today in many, in many Latin American cities, what we have is a concession already in place. And these concessions not uh, are very long. They, they last 10 years more or less. And they, they need to be adapted to 15 years to, to include the e-buses and sometimes uh, it we still have like five, five years or eight years of concession in this the existing model. So it's not it's not easy to change the existing concession models. So, but they allow for the operator to subcontract and have a and have a leasing contract. So, uh, it's a only, the only model, for example, in a city, in São Paulo city at this moment without big big changes in in the concession. Uh, but the major challenge that we face in in Latin American city is that most of the cities say all right we need to we need to start the transition we have the law we have the target but we cannot pay more we cannot pay more subsidies than we are already paying or we don't pay subsidies and we won't pay subsidies so the challenge that we face in the moment is to find a way that not the tco the tco is already okay but the way a way that the monthly payments that the municipality pays on subsidies it's not higher than uh, than the diesel bus at this moment. So that's the question that we are setting with the utility company. So, for example, we have NLX, which is one utility company and investor that is willing to buy e-buses, charging infrastructure, and provide energy in Brazil. And they at, at this moment we have a ten percent higher price for the EBUS monthly payments together with the fare and the subsidy. And we are finding ways to make this equal. It's a very difficult task, but uh, this uh, has to do with the guarantees that we talked in the beginning. So if we find a way that the payment goes through the municipality, if you find a way that this payment uh, priority from the municipality goes to the asset owner first, then it can be possible that they provide a leasing price lower. And there is also gains in scale as well. If you buy more, if you have a contract for 200 e-buses, then it, the price can be lower for each bus. So that's the challenge that we face now uh, and that we are facing in most of all the cities, uh, in fact, to, to continue the, in accelerating the EPAS deployments. All right, thank you, um, Bianca, for your answer. Next, we'd like to also uh, move back or proceed back to Sutanu regarding another question, especially on the PAYS model. Uh, is the PAYS model replicable here in Indonesia itself? And in your opinion, what are the things needed to be changed in order to be able to adopt the business models? Uh, yeah, we evaluated the PACE model for Jakarta and uh, given the financial condition of uh, the electricity utility company, uh, we don't think we can use the PACE model as it is. Uh, we cannot expect PNL to um, come up and finance the batteries and there were some issues with the battery manufacturers also. Uh, so as it is, we cannot use the PACE model, but definitely we can uh, look at uh, a third parties owning and providing the charging service uh, for sure. So that is not a problem at all. Uh, we can have at least 15% of the cost required, um, uh, you know, removed from the financing requirements. So there are third party investors who are willing to set up the charging facilities 
and they can be paid uh, based on the you know amount of charging that or the charging service that the buses use and because the buses will be you know using uh, this consistently so there is no uncertainty and therefore this cost can be reduced so i I'm, i know that trans jakarta is um, uh, looking to uh, deploy this model so yes to an extent we can use the pays model but uh, like it is used in uh, latin america we cannot go to that extent in indonesia i think all right, thank you very much, Mr. Prati, for uh, explaining to us your views and insights on that matter. Thank you once again to Mr. Sudan Upati and also Ms. Bianca Macedo for pre your presentations, for sharing your insights, and of course, for taking part in our discussion. And thank you to all the participants who have actively participated and proposed your question. But unfortunately, that was the last question that we can propose or ask the presenters and speakers for the second question and answer session. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we will continue to our next agenda uh, this morning, which is we will be having a peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange and also another discussion session. And here, as you can see, it will be divided into two discussion rooms. The first room will be the main room and it will be the peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange between Electra and bus operators with the case study of Mumbai, Pune and Hyderabad, which will be led and organized by Ms. Sharada Golakudi, the ITDP international e-mobility expert. And this discussion in the main room will be delivered in English. And the next a discussion room is a breakout room, which will be the panel discussion between Trans Jakarta OEMs, the Ministry of Industry and Ministry of Finance on the eBus rollout action plan, which will be led by Ms. Gita Pajar Saptiani, the senior project advisor at C40 Cities Finance Facility. And ladies and gentlemen, before we begin, please do allow me to explain to you the house rules for the discussion session in the main room and also the breakout room. First, the committee has assigned the participants to the main room or the breakout room. The participants will then automatically enter the breakout room. All you have to do is click or choose the join button. And the participants who would like to attend the peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange session Please do stay in the main room and please do keep your microphone on mute and please change your Zoom name, for example, your institution slash your name. Here we can see, for example, ITDP Indonesia slash Rifki Anam. And ladies and gentlemen, if you are invited to ask questions, you may raise your hand and then you may unmute your microphone. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I will allow you to enter the breakout room and also probably stay in the main room to continue our discussion for the next 45 minutes. Therefore, I would like to pass on the discussion to Ms. Sharada Kolapuri and also Ms. Gita Fajar Saptiani to please moderate our discussion session. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can can I start? Please do, Ms. Golapudi. Please do start the discussion. Yeah. So good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the session on peer-to-peer uh, -peer knowledge exchange on uh, electric uh, buses deployment. Uh, my name is Sharda Golapudi, and I'm a consultant with ITDP, supporting on the deployment of their electric buses with uh, Trans Jakarta. So uh, today, joining us. Uh, on the panel are uh, Mr. Vijay Kumar, uh, General Manager, Electra, and uh, Sandeep uh, Raizada, Head of eBus Operations from Electra. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Lokesh Chandra, General Manager, Best uh, from Mumbai, hasn't been able to join us today. Uh, we also have several operators from Trans Jakarta as part of the panel who are keen on learning uh, from experiences in India and sharing their uh, questions. Uh, so we hope to have uh, a fruitful and uh, rich uh, discussion uh, today. 
So uh, would like, I would like to start with a few thoughts. Uh, we have uh, seen uh, that uh, uh, electrification of buses uh, across several cities globally is helping improving the air quality uh, and also decarbonizing our cities. Uh, Trans Jakarta also has a embarked on this journey uh, by piloting their first set of uh, 30 buses. And they also have a roadmap of 50% uh, uh, electrification by 2025. So uh, it would be good to learn uh, from cities uh, uh, like Indian cities uh, like Mumbai, Pune, who have already embarked on this journey of electrification and uh, draw on their uh, experience of what are the challenges and what are the barriers and what are the opportunities that the electrification uh, poses and uh, how this uh, knowledge can be a learning for all of us today. So uh, I asked Mr. Vijay uh, Medikunda. So uh, my first uh, question to you, Mr. Vijay, uh, is you have already uh, deployed electric buses in uh, various about 40 STUs in India. So what has been your experience on uh, uh, these deployments, how it has varied from city to city, how the operations and planning uh, is different from city to city, and uh, how many buses overall have you deployed? We have uh, deployed around 750 electric buses across the country, and uh, total number of STUs that we have deployed are under uh, under deployment will be around 20, not 40, 40 bus, 40 STUs. We have given our buses for them to experience the product and technology and feasibility. This is what we have done. When it comes to uh, majorly to talk about BST Mumbai, Mumbai city, uh, uh, the per day coverage operations will be around 150 to 160 kilometers. So, the problem in Mumbai city is that the average per kilometer speed, like I mean, per hour uh, speed can be attained, will be around 17 kilometer per hour and very highly congested roads uh, and passenger load will be, 100 passenger load will be there in each bus, in a 12 meter bus. Whereas the regulation says only to go ahead with 55 passenger load. However, public transport cannot say, in public transport, you cannot say to the passengers, it is overboarded and please take the next bus that we cannot anyway make. So we'll have to accept whoever, whatever amount of passengers can be boarded in the bus uh, has to be allowed to board the bus. This is uh, about BST Mumbai and BST Mumbai, uh, this city is known as financial capital of India. Uh, there is a huge amount of traffic on roads and uh, power supply is very, very good because the, the corporation which is handling transport is also handling power supply for the citizens of Mumbai in the city. So that's how they are very, very uh, effective in terms of availability of power and a quality power. And when it comes to uh, depots, yes, they have very good depots and depot spaces available with which we our operations were <clears throat> quite comfortable. Going forward, if I compare with Pune, Pune Municipal Corporation and uh, Pune Mahanagar Parivahan Mahamandal Limited, these are the two entities which handle uh, uh, public transport uh, in the city of Pune. So Pune is India's one of the largest electric bus uh, uh, operating location with, with around uh, 650 electric buses projects are going on. Uh, when it comes to Pune, yes, roads are a bit wider and it's a, a bus rapid transport system corridor with which load, uh, uh, though passenger load is higher, traffic is quite lower compared to um, any other like i mean like mumbai and when it comes to uh, pune we operate around 225 kilometer of bus a day uh, which is higher than mumbai city but the passenger load in pune city is almost touching upon 100 passengers in a bus 100 passengers in a bus including standees and sitting capacity and when it comes to Hyderabad, this is a, a typical example uh, that we request even uh, government of Indonesia to implement Trans Jakarta. Every day, electric buses are being operated between 350 kilometers to 425 kilometers. So this is the distance that each bus will cover in Hyderabad city with which 
STU is very, very happy. And we were also able to quote very, very aggressive rates for kilometer rates. We are also happy for operating longer distances. Authorities are happy. Roads are wider. Traffic is moderate, 25 kilometer per hour. And they operate electric buses for longer distance routes, especially for airport routes and uh, for, for uh, city to nearest um, uh, will, the nearest villages, nearest towns, they connect with these electric buses. So there are three types of electric bus operations, basically any bus operations in public transport. One is city bus operation. The other is city to nearest town or nearest village or nearest mandal, uh, that is suburbans, satellite towns. And third is city to the other city, which may be a far away city from the existing city. So it has to be seen in such a way we have to tap these two options. One is city operations as well as connected to satellite town operation also, with which you will be able to pull out more distance per bus per day and more Mr. public Fijay? can be traveled in the electric buses. Yeah. Mr. Vijay, once again, can you please slow down your pace of speech for the yeah, interpreter sure. to help uh, translate? Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah. I am repeating this, this major uh, point. What I am trying to say is that there are three types of public transport operations anywhere in the world. One is within city operations. That means buses will be commuting, commuting for the for transporting the public within the city. Number two, that, that means Jakarta within Jakarta city. Number two, Jakarta to nearby satellite towns. This is second mode of operation. And Jakarta to, to any other city in Indonesia will be under third category. Now, while Trans Jakarta is planning for deploy, deploying electric buses there. It is advised to prefer city bus transport as well as nearby satellite town transport with which, with which the deployment of electric buses will be more financially feasible for them. So this is all what is our experience uh, across all these cities. And you will have to have a better longer range buses with which your per day coverage and per day requirements are also met. And if you go with the longer range buses, you don't need to provide input power supply in so many places. If you have input power supply in one depot, that is where you will be operating buses for the whole day. That means you don't need to pay for demand charges also when you have a single charging station. That is one more advantage what we are going to gain out of it. Uh, so, uh, what are the uh, battery sizes uh, that you have in Hyderabad? Uh, the buses are already clocking 350 kilometers. Uh, it has, yeah, uh, it has got 395-400 kilowatt hour battery size. So, uh, what uh, what is your experience on uh, you know the energy consumption? Uh, of these buses since uh, the passenger loading, uh, you were saying that in Mumbai, uh, the buses were overcrowded and uh, you know they were taking more passengers. Uh, so it would obviously impact the range uh, of the bus by uh, you know consuming more energy. So uh, can you throw some more light on that? Uh, yes, yes. See, uh, actually we are also suffering with this. Uh, in the contract which we have signed with BEST Mumbai, uh, energy charges will have to be paid by BEST. So up to a limit of one kilowatt hour per kilometer. If there is any excessive energy consumption beyond a kilowatt hour per kilometer will have to be paid by the operator. Now, if the buses are operating with 65 passenger, 100 passenger, it doesn't matter for the authority where beyond one kilowatt hour rates for beyond charges for beyond one kilowatt hour are being paid by the operator. Now I request Trans Jakarta to pay for energy charges, the scope of payment for energy charges to be kept in Trans Jakarta scope only so that your operator will not have any issues with that. So now irrespective of number of passengers being transported, being moved in the bus, it doesn't have any impact on the operator and the operator also will be happy. So I think this is how it has to be seen. Okay. Uh, 
and another note, uh, you have been uh, strongly uh, advocating about the uh, overnight charging. So have you also deployed other uh, charging strategies, uh, uh, any opportunity charging uh, examples? No, we don't believe into intermediate charging. Our, our strategy, our theory is that uh, we wanted to help the country or uh, the countries whichever wanted to get into electric mobility by bringing a longer range buses which will be only charged in the night time with which the grid stability can be achieved also the rates for energy charging in the night time are lesser compared to daytime charging and also we believe that the availability of buses in the daytime operations is is hugely uh, obstructed because of intermediate charging in the daytime. So please don't pursue to go for intermediate charging, prefer to go for nighttime charging alone. This is our best experience out of last six years operations of electric buses in India and having operated around six, six, uh, 60 million kilometers on Indian roads, operated electric buses. It is actually an inconvenience to the operator also in case if i have to do intermediate charging in the daytime i have to have additional manpower who has to be available in the depot for charging the buses and not only that in major cases depot will be at a place called a and route will end at a place called b now after the first shift if if your route is ending at b you have to bring back your bus from b to a which means there is no passenger, which is called a dead kilometer. That means Trans Jakarta will not be able to make any revenues in this stretch of A to B, with which there is a loss of uh, loss of uh, revenue kilometer, also loss of time, also operator charges to Trans Jakarta to pay for this dead kilometer because it is not his responsibility, right? So this kind of uh, hidden issues are also there in this. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, what are the uh, typical uh, parameters that you have considered for uh, route selection? Uh, do you have uh, any choice in that, or the transit agencies give you the uh, routes uh, routes to be electrified? Um, uh, it is not of our choice. It will be decided by uh, by the agencies itself. And however, they will take our consent while finalizing the routes. Every single time we will ask for longer routes only to operate buses for more distance. Because if they operate more distance, our feasibility will be high. However, in the contract, they will provide assured kilometers per bus per day, 200 kilometer will be operated. That means operator will be earning a revenue of 200 kilometer into the rate, whatever he has quoted. So we will try to give our inputs to increase the feasibility or like operations beyond 200 kilometer with which we will also be able to generate some revenue. Uh, so I think if any of the operators have questions, uh, they can also write the questions in the chat box or uh, they can also probably ask uh, directly. So meantime, I, I wanted to give so, a uh, yeah yeah share the meantime meantime let people ask the question. I wanted to convey some information here. Uh, if it is possible, uh, I request Trans Jakarta to visit India to see how electric buses are being operated here. Volatra will help them to take them to the existing depots operation locations so that they can understand the routes, how routes are designed, right? What are the challenges involved in the real-time operations? They can witness that, they can see, learn, understand, and then implement in it Indonesia also. We are Volatra is ready to support them in the in this aspect. So uh, another question, Mr. Vijay, is uh, how is the crew scheduling and uh, you know uh, and the uh, other aspects of maintenance. Uh, so how are these, uh, you know, happening for uh, electric buses and different from their uh, conventional IC counterparts? 
these are two different things. Uh, cruise scheduling will be like this. Oper public transport operations will be available in any city. Public operation, public transport operations will be available in any city, say from four o'clock in the morning, may end it 11 to 12 o'clock in the night. Now, if I have to bifurcate into two sessions, session one and session two, session one will be using a driver who drives the bus. And after, after that, he will take the bus back to the depot or wherever the terminal end point at point B. There, the second driver will come and take the charge of the bus. Now, when to take care of maintenance? After 10 o'clock, after 11 o'clock, once the bus comes back to the depot in the night time for charging, we will charge the bus for three to five hours, and then we will have another five hours time for maintaining the buses. Now, what kind of maintenance is involved in electric buses? Compared to ICE vehicles, there is no big maintenance involved in the buses because it is electronically configured. So I, we can see whatever issues are there in the buses in the clusters itself. So we can connect a computer diagnosis tool, and then we can understand what are the issues are there in the bus. So hardly it will take each bus maybe can be, can be inspected within a span of 30 minutes time. However, there are schedules given by service uh, ex ex experts, uh, daily schedules, and then weekly schedules, fortnight schedules, and monthly schedules, and quarterly schedules, six year schedules. So that may take, these schedules may take another two hours time. However, we have kept a, a span of five hours time every day in the night to maintain the buses. Uh, what is the cost of uh, uh, the maintenance that you are uh, incurring and uh, how is it comparable to the diesel buses maintenance cost? Cost of maintaining electric buses. I think we have to see it into this uh, dimension. Mm. When it comes to maintenance in electric buses, which also includes replacement of lithium ion battery cells or entire battery or modular pack. However, when you compare cost of maintenance of electric bus and cost of maintenance of ICE bus, for a period of entire its lifetime, electric buses are cheaper compared to the ICE buses. Uh, what happens? What, what some, happens? Uh, specific figures on what is the actual maintenance cost that you're incurring? Say, for example, if I am operating my city bus in Hyderabad, for an about 350 to 400 kilometer, maintenance cost is coming around 3.5 rupees. It depends upon the number of kilometers you are operating. Every single thing in this electric vehicle project depends upon number of kilometers that you are operating, right? Like, uh, uh, like our the other panelist was mentioning about Latin America project contract period timelines. So some contracts are there for eight years, 10 years. The more that you reduce the contract time period, that also indirectly impact the kilometers that the bus will be covering in a lifetime. So every aspect in electric vehicle project is based upon the coverage that the bus is going to make in its daily, monthly, or yearly, or lifetime period. So please focus on more kilometers so that you will have an effective electric bus ecosystem in the country. And uh, 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 what about the difference in maintenance for uh, AC and non-AC buses? And also difference in energy consumption for uh, AC and non-AC buses? We strongly advocate to prefer air-conditioned buses only because electric buses are noiseless buses. The moment you are using a noiseless bus, like, you know, you, you know, uh, uh, if the public in the country or in the city are exposed to higher levels of decibels, that is also leading to some health issues. Now, the point is, if your passenger inside the bus is traveling and exposed to higher decibels, which is coming from outside the bus, that is also causing a problem for him. So it is always better to go for air-conditioned bus and the people 
people also will be happy with the kind of features available inside the bus when it comes to maintenance there is only one additional factor uh, that is air conditioner maintenance which gets involved into it and when it comes to uh, the other question is the cost right what is the cost difference in the power consumption right there is yeah. point there is point 1 to point 2 difference in per in uh, power consumption if an ac bus consumes 1 kilowatt hour per kilometer ac bus may consume 1.1 .1 or 1.2 kilowatt hour per kilometer now apart from this however even though there is a higher power consumption however trans jakarta will charge slightly higher passenger fares for air ac buses i will explain you one case study which we have experienced in pune in india pune india has deployed ac electric buses and they kept it open for all kind all types of passengers in india there is a scheme available for the students that they can travel through public transport buses in some cities on free of cost in some cities it is a monthly pass which is with a subsidy now what pune has done they have allowed all the students and and to to travel through these ac buses with the same ticket fares so the difference is now you use a ac bus people start leaving their four wheelers at home see one one idea one initiative that you as a public servant takes which is impacting the entire ecosystem of the city if i bring ac electric bus into jakarta city what will happen four wheeler usage will go down that will reduce usage of diesel that will reduce the traffic on the roads also so we recommend to go for ac buses itself uh, so mr vijay there is a question from one of the participants uh, from trans jakarta mr inshan rido is asking how does the bus operator in hyderabad or other cities in india mainly raise the capital capacity for the e bus operation especially in initial stages is there any local or foreign investor available in india uh no actually see our company uh, as i mentioned eway trans private limited eway trans private limited which is owned by our parent company so we infuse complete capitals into the business by our own we don't take investments from any other uh, foreign investor and all completely it is uh, totally invested by us uh, with our own funds and all our assets whatever we have deployed as on today are debt free assets we don't take any loan also from any bankers so ours is very financially sounded entity so it is possible for us to deploy buses with our own funds uh okay and uh, another question uh, to you is on the battery degradation uh, would you be able to share some uh, insight on what uh, what kind of range uh, you have achieved in the uh, first year versus in the later years uh, what kind of uh, battery degradation do you foresee uh, there are two types of degradation uh, or uh, utilization of battery uh, first is that you may be assuming that whatever product you are giving uh, placing into the public transport will be able to operate 200 kilometers in a single charge range now if the load is increased battery performance will go down if driver is not performing well battery performance will go down this is one if the outside temperature is higher battery performance will go down if the number of stops in the route are higher that means if there are 30 stops in in a route you have to open the doors close the doors and it takes another one minute time for the passengers to board to alight and delight from the bus now the point is these factors also including traffic on the roads will impact the battery performance number one for a brand new day one bus going forward year two year three year four of operations there is yes there is a degradation factor as a basic nature dna of a battery yes the performance the storage capacity of battery will go lower between two to three percent year on year two to three percent Sure. And uh, when do you uh, expect to replace the batteries? 
uh, this is what I see. Uh, this is a this is a whole new uh, for everybody in the world. Uh, for every uh, consumer, every uh, government agency, this is an unknown industry, unknown space. We don't know. So we assume that batteries will be replaced, which is not right. Batteries need not to be replaced. Battery cells. See, battery is a combination of module. Mod, uh, battery pack is a combination of module. Module is a combination of pack, uh, is a cell. So this is where the experience of electric bus makers comes into the picture. Now, company like BYD, they have got this technology where they can also perform, reboost the batteries at a pack level, module level, or cell level also. Right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I would like to pause here and uh, see if uh, any of the operators would like to uh, ask any questions. Um, if not, uh, can you also uh, talk about- Hi, Sarada. Uh, Sorry to interrupt. Uh, this is Financia. Uh, so I think uh, in San Rido from Transjakarta want to ask a question for PJ. So yeah, could yeah, you please? Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Sarada, and also Finan for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to, to discuss with uh, Mr. PJ Kumar. That is very insightful discussion from you that uh, you, you share about the the, the experience there in India about how to operate the bus and I just asked about the how the the, the bus operator uh, finance their their operation in the initial stage because uh, the condition in Indonesia is quite different Mr. Vijay since yeah a couple of bus operator is still struggling with their financing especially for the electric buses since yeah, it's, you know that the, the capital capacity should be twice or uh, thrice higher higher than the, the, the conventional buses, right? So yeah, they need to have like a sort of uh, financing options in the beginning to, to, to buy the buses because yeah, in Indonesia, they have to buy the buses and also they have to procure the charging system, the infrastructure, the grid uh, provision for their operation. So that's why I asked you how about uh, the, the financing options in India. Uh, so, but you you answer it uh, in a good way that yeah, you 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 already have a, your parent company to supply and to support your financing. That's good for you. But yeah, maybe uh, since uh, yeah we have worked with other uh, institution as well like uh, ITDP to have like uh, uh, studies on how to finance the electric bus in 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 a bigger scale especially in initial stage so yeah just i i just wondering that uh maybe uh, what is a kind of a incentive that you find very useful in terms of like the scheme that happens in india like the fame scheme as i know that uh helps you a lot about the 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 running of operation or the procurement of the bus, which kind of uh, uh, incentive that puts you in a good position of operating electric buses in India mostly. I just want to ask you about that first before we discuss other things. Yeah, Thank you. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Rito, I'll, I'll, I'll explain you on this. Uh, financing, when, when it comes to financing, there are two parts again. First one is, you wanted to multiply the numbers of uh, electric buses in the country for private transport also that is altogether a different dimension as of now since you started getting into public transport for electrification let us limit it to that only because bringing finance for private sectors is completely for private operators is completely different that requires a ecosystem which where your government has to involve and work with the existing bankers to fund for electric buses, right? So let us park it aside. Now, when it comes to the public transport organization, yes, Trans Jakarta require electric buses. There are different ways of doing it. Number one, electric buses are capital intensive. Why don't you think about giving some subsidy on capital with which vehicle cost will come down so that per kilometer rates will be lesser to you. Number one, 
Number two, try to operate these electric buses without revenue collector. Automatic fare collection system that will give you a edge of five to six rupees per kilometer in cost reduction. Number three, when it comes to financing part, apart from your capital subsidy, in case if Trans Jakarta require funds, they can approach through ITDP any international funding agencies like World Bank, which will come and give you help for 2000 buses, 3000 buses like that, right? I think ITDP can be able to easily bring World Bank to you with which you can sign a MOU with their green funds and get it done. Now, in case if you need any uh, a, a capable investor, uh, you will have to develop capable investors inside the country or from overseas countries. There are companies who are willing to come and invest into the business and grass cost model or uh, outright purchase model. Initially, that ecosystem will develop. I'll explain you something uh, very, uh, uh, only few people in the country may be knowing this. In India, when electric vehicle system, uh, this momentum has started, initially two wheelers were put on the road. These two wheelers were not capable to conquer the roads, the gradients, the flyover heights and all, gradabilities. Then what has happened? We all started believing that electric vehicles are of no use. It cannot pull me in my flyover. It cannot take me to a longer distance. That was the perception. And what has happened, thanks to BYD, they have started working in India and we have had a tie up with them. This is the company which has offered us a longer range electric buses, the technology they have provided, with which we started putting our buses on road. If you bring a bus on road, 200 people will see that. They believe that electric vehicle technology is possible with which two-wheeler, three-wheeler, four-wheeler consumer starts getting into EV industry. So I request you to encourage this momentum, at least to take some funds from the government to buy some buses and apply the buses. Now, like you did in uh, existing uh, project, two, three projects you will have to do like this. Otherwise, if you want to go for per kilometer cost, please go with a little higher capital subsidies to the operators so that they will reduce it into the vehicle cost and quote you the lesser rates. Okay, thank you for your explanation and would love to, to come to India if possible Please. To, to see the, Please. The, Please. The, the, the operation there. So thanks for the invitation. But one more question that I found interesting for, uh, for you that you prefer to use the overnight charging uh, only for your bus operation instead of going like for uh, opportunity char charging or the terminal charging, right? So what what kind of uh, intention that you want? Since, yeah, I think in our operation in Transjakarta later on, especially for BRT operation, I think we will go for the opportunity charging since uh, the, the distance to the depot for the bus operator is quite long. And like you said, the dead kilometers will be high and we have a cap on the dead kilometers fee for each operator, so there will be a problem for them. So in our operation later on in the future, we probably will have uh, to prepare the opportunity charging. But why in your side you decide to 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 come only the for the overnight charging only? That is not quite possible in our operation. So can you explain more on that? Um. Uh, I'll explain you. Uh, if I go for nighttime charging, first of all, uh, my per kilo per kilo what our energy cost is lesser, right? Which is lesser by almost uh, ten to fifteen percent of what I am paying in the daytime. That is one thing. Second thing, if I have to do intermediate charging in the daytime, the time schedules available are twenty minute, thirty minute, forty minute, not more than that. Within this 30 minute, 40 minute, if I have to charge the bus, I have to use a fast charger. Problem with fast chargers is the life cycle of battery will go down. This is one major concern. Apart from that, if I have to charge my buses in the daytime, I have to have my manpower available in the depots. 
you see per kilometer cost of electric bus gcc model leasing model at least 30% of the cost will be manpower cost only 30% so i can eliminate this expenditure which is actually not required now let us talk about the disadvantages of what is wrong if i go for night time charging first one i will use a long higher battery capacity <clears throat> right now please understand it a little intensively i will buy a car which is 20 lakh and i will use it for 5 year which will give 10 km per liter diesel mileage i will buy a car which is 15 lakh rupees which is 5 lakh lesser than the above other example i gave and which will consume more fuel compared to other car that means we on the period of 5 years what i am investing what i am spending on this car is what we have to see similarly you come to electric buses here i will use a higher range battery i am going to operate the bus not on a daily basis for entire contract period you see in a contract period how many kilometers i am going to use this electric bus so this battery range also whether you use a small battery you use a longer battery there is no difference because you have to operate the bus for those many 15 lakh kilometer 10 lakh kilometer over entire contract period replacement of battery majorly depends upon number of kilometers you have operated so it doesn't make any difference you longer range batteries will help me to give more life of battery number one it is very simple if you can rightly understand this concept you have a battery mobile battery first 20 percent of 100 percent battery capacity that means 80 to 100 percent and then 80 to you come down another 60 percent you bring it back zero to 20 percent is like very very sensitive which means which cannot hold more energy so if i go for a longer battery size if i go for a shorter battery size and if i give a 100 kilometer battery capacity zero to 20 percent means which is 20 kilowatt hour battery capacity is very sensitive here in this case now let me go to the other battery which is a 200 kilometer battery where you see 0 to 20 percent will really come down to 0 to 10 percent that is where you are going to save right the more battery capacity the the area of faster consumption of battery capacity will be lesser that means you go for lower battery you have to charge multiple times with which you are attaining to this 0 to 20 percent more times so it is that's why we we uh, normally prefer actually what happens as an operator as a manufacturer in india once you sign gcc contract with the government agency and if i fail to operate the buses as per the agency routes and scheduling every day agency will put fines on me so i we don't want to take any chance of taking fines because it is not actually viable to run and again if you are penalized with the fines for non operation of buses non availability of buses because of battery drainage that is going to be huge loss to the entity so that's why we prefer to go for longer range buses only thank you for your answer i think uh, before i start the follow up on this i just have one question before i close uh, my question here so uh, i think yeah you got a good point about the the bigger battery will have a, like a bigger impact on your operation as well so yeah i can understand that but how about the limitation of the the bus weight or the the operational weight is there any limitation from the in the indian government or the the, the city municipality uh, government that uh, you cannot go far beyond the, like 20 tons or uh, 25 tons let's say so because in our operation we we also have a limitation in terms of like the weight the allowed weight for uh, the operation that's why we come to the like uh, smaller batteries since 
if we go to the bigger batteries for the BRT buses, that's, that means that we have to cut down our uh, passenger capacity uh, to, 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 to balance with the, the battery weight that will be bigger if we use the bigger battery, right? So, so is there any limitation in regards of the allowable weight in the city or municipality, municipality government in India? Yeah, uh, see, uh, there are testing centers, there are rules which are already framed, uh, which mention that there is a higher cap on the, the GVW, gross vehicle weight of the bus, number one. These rules are already set in India. Now, when it comes to public transport, though these rules are already stipulated, still more passengers will be boarded into the buses is because of two reasons. One is that lack of availability of buses for public transport in the cities. The other is when you, when you have lesser buses for more passenger requirement, you will have to you will have to accept the fact that more passengers has to be loaded and operated that way right number 2 government agencies transport agencies are already under tremendous financial stress in the country because in our country we uh, our governments offer public transport at lesser cost for the public so that public can commute with lesser expenditure and they can grow in a better way. So it's already subsidized in India. Public transport is subsidized. So with which there is a financial stress on the government institute. Now, if they go for within GVW load, their revenues will further come down. So for government agencies, yes, it is not approved in writing, but they are allowed to carry more passengers beyond the GVW loads. All right, uh, thank you. I think I got your point there regarding the GVW uh, limitation, but yeah, I, I, I got your point about your preference to bigger battery and overnight charging. So thank you, Mr. Vijay Kumar. I hope we can uh, have you. another discussion with you and the, 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 the people from uh, uh, the India how to operate the buses. So thank you, Sarada, as well for the opportunity here to discuss. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Inshan Ridu. Uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Vijay, there's another question from one of the participants. Uh, so what is the typical uh, staff needed uh, for uh, uh, the bus maintenance, uh, excluding the admin? Uh, so, uh, so this would include the drivers uh, and uh, even the, the charging maintenance uh, uh, staff and uh, staff related to ed, uh, operations and uh... I, I request mr sandeep raisda to answer this question in case if he's available in the session yeah yeah this is in fact uh, we will bifurcate this uh, maintenance part into two things first is the charging infrastructure maintenance and second is the bus uh, maintenance uh, structure for charging infrastructure, we need basically this is a 415. We are operating all the thing on the 415 volt. So we need electricians for that. And uh, accordingly, we do the preventive maintenance schedules are also there for the charging infrastructure that we do on a regular basis as per the, requ as per the uh, uh, requirement of the uh, manufacturer of these infrastructure, uh, in charging infrastructure company. So we do the, 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 for that electricians are required, some safety measures are there to regulate and to control the, for, um, for any mishappening or anything. And uh, as preventive maintenance are meant for, to prevent uh, all the, the mishappening or the, to increase the life of the infrastructure or the part of the, uh, any, any sort of machinery. So in the other case, uh, when we talk about the bus maintenance, the bus maintenance in electric bus is very much a requirement. I mean, the very low requirements are there in comparison to ICE buses. Basically, the most of the moving parts, about the 70 to 80 percent moving parts have been removed from ICE engine, ICE vehicle. 
as the engine is not there, the transmission part is not there, the gearbox is not there. So what we, what we are doing now, we have a HT battery, HT battery is there, and we have motors over there, and all controls are through electronic thing. So we need a, we have a, a cluster arrangements. We have a cluster arrangement over there in the bus, where each and every defects would be shown, and we can diagnose the we can diagnose the, all the requirements, or if there is anything. Uh, uh, any problem in the bus, we can diagnose and we can remove the defects. Regular maintenance is the for the, say, in, even in this, uh, our, in our product, we have replaced the rear axle part also, where the crown wheel tail pinion, which is the biggest part in the rear axle thing, which basically used to when the bus gets done to, in, to maintain the stabilization between the two, vac two wheels, the rear and I mean the right and the left. Now, what uh, the function of crown wheel tail pinion also is being monitored by electric motors and the, our steering parts. So all other parts, are, all the mechanical parts have gone. Only the mechanical regular maintenance for the mechanical thing. If I, disc, if I discuss, this is the rear axle for the hubs and wheels are there, and the body maintenance is there. If we are have an AC, we have to maintain an AC as per the regular schedules. So overall, maintenance part has gone, I mean, uh, have been very less. So it is very easy to maintain the electric bus. Moreover, whenever we think about the electric bus being a new thing, and we always consider because uh, this is uh, energy and the electric is there, we always get afraid of it. But there is no issues. There are so many safety measures in the, in the bus that each and every problem can be sensed before it happens. For the charging also, we have to, we need to put a chargers and that is, that is generally a port is given in the bus. And we just have to put these charging guns into the bus. It has to be connected. And if there is any loose connection, it will, it will again give the alarm. So th that there is no, uh, uh, there is no, no problem in doing all these things. So yeah, well, we can say, that the overall maintenance is easy and very much uh, can be can be done at any depot level, whatever facility we have. Yeah, please. So, uh, so what is the manpower required uh, for the maintenance and also uh, the drivers uh, and other uh, bus related aspects in operations? Yeah, yeah, Shada. In fact, uh, for this, uh, the drivers are the drivers are dependent on the operation requirement. Yeah, drivers are not part of the maintenance. Drivers are uh, drivers are required as per schedule, and the basically the legislation of the land that that maintains the how many drivers are required. As in India, we have to we cannot we have to operate a steer, we can give us a steering duty of seven and uh, seven and uh, seven hour thirty minutes to a driver in a day. That too with the different gaps. So the schedules are made like this by the authority that uh, these legislative compliances are made. And uh, for the maintenance purpose, what I said uh, generally in uh, our uh, in our uh, earlier system, IC engine system, there was, a there was a people that those were required about uh, in overall uh, capacity, if, if I talk about, that was around uh, 0.8 person per bus. Now with this electric, this electric bus, we have reduced it to 0.4 to 0.5% per bus. But you have to think about this. These numbers are basically with the particular number, not, not for a one or two bus. Basically, we have to develop an ecosystem of uh, maintenance in a depot. So critical size is required. If, I, if we go with the about, uh, say, 100 bus depot, then these number would uh, be implemented because there are the requirement is that some mechanical technicians are there and the majorly electric, electrical technicians are there and the AC, electrici AC electricians are there. So this is the th three category, what we do. And for the upkeep and all, that is the, that is the requirement. It, it depends upon the what services you are going to do. If for the, say, for the cleaning, you are using uh, uh, these uh, automatic, uh, automatic bus washing system, then the requirement would be different. If you are having a different vacuum cleaning and all, that is requirement. 
will be different so these things are these things are basically these facilities are uh, dependent on the what is the philosophy you are taking and what are the what sort of practices you are having but for maintenance of uh, these buses scheduled maintenance and all these things it is comes around 0.4 to 0.5 person per bus for a critical size uh thank you mr sudha uh, sandeep and uh, in uh, following up to that question what kind of uh, contingencies uh, do you plan for uh, running the e buses in in case of breakdowns or uh, unavailability of uh, charging well this is a good question but generally what do we do what do we do the there is a term soc this is a state of charge basically it reflects on the cluster in front of driver so generally uh, uh, the majorly the charging and discharge is a linear thing so when we, uh, we uh, these drivers are always uh, attentive to the soc present soc of the bus so we understand and even uh, we have a developer we have uh, some uh, it programming also and we have uh, basically these data are transmitted over the air to our control room also so we know that what is the soc of each and every bus so we plan if there is a the, the soc goes down below say we generally plan operation up to 80% ioc soc so 20% we keep as a reserve as we all know that generally earlier when the scooters were there there was a i mean the reserve switch was there for the petrol and all so like likewise we keep 20% soc as a reserve and we generally operate buses up to 80% soc so that there is a no scarcity there is no scarcity of power and these buses should not be uh, stuck in the in the road for the want of electricity uh good to know that so uh, mr sandeep uh, we are uh, already over time and i think we have to wrap up this uh, discussion so thank you very much mr vijay and uh, mr sandeep uh, for giving us insights and uh, uh, answering our questions on uh, some of the aspects of uh, uh, planning and operation of e buses uh we'll also reach out to you oh, hopefully uh, further uh, uh, if uh, trans jakarta or uh, some of the operators here uh, have more questions and thank you for your time uh, and uh, with this i would like like to uh, wrap up this uh, discussion and uh, uh, over to you uh, sara thanks a thank lot you. and you are always most welcome for any queries or any support if you require we have a live operation you can plan any time to visit india and you can have a, a glimpse of the live op live operation thank you thank you as thank well thank you very much sandeep raizada thank you very much especially to our moderator ms sharada golapudi thank you very much for uh, moderating our discussion session in the main room which is the peer to peer knowledge exchange between electra and bus operators with the case study of mumbai pune and hyderabad and thank you once again ms sharapada kolapudi the itdp international e mobility export and ladies and gentlemen we are still awaiting for the participants from the breakout room to wrap up their session and to also rejoin us in the main room as well and we hope that you had a wonderful and fruitful discussion especially in exchanging the knowledge to further support the adaptability of the e mobility and e vehicles in our respective cities and it appears here that uh, the participants from the breakout room is rejoining our main room therefore welcome ladies and gentlemen once again to the main room and we hope you had a wonderful uh, discussion as well in discussion discussing with the panelists of the trans jakarta oems and also the ministry of industry and ministry of finance on ebus roll out action plan and now um, we would also like to thank the moderator for moderating such a wonderful session uh, in the breakout room Thank you, Ms. Gita Fajar Saptiani, 
it appears that she has already joined our main room, the Senior Project Advisor at C40 Cities Finance C40. Thank you very much, Ms. Gita Fajar Sabdiani, for moderating. And ladies and gentlemen, with that, we have come to the end of our third day of our e-mobility event, the workshop on technology selection and business model for electric buses and peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. We, of course, like to thank you for participating and thank you for your enthusiasm. And we'd like to also thank all the speakers, all the panel for today, for sharing your insights and also experience with us. And uh, we would like to also thank the moderators for the main room and also breakout session. Thank you very much once again. And ladies and gentlemen, before we end, I would like to inform you regarding our next agenda, which will be held on March 16th, 2022, or next week, where we will continue our workshop with more speakers and also um, a question and answer session and of course another breakout room discussion session. Our next agenda are our e-mobility event day four will have the topic of findings dissemination to city level government and public transport operators and once again it will be held on the 16th of March 2022 and we will start once again at 9 a.m. Western Indonesia time. So please do take note of the schedule and please do join us again. For the workshop, we'll then focus on the dissemination of the toolkit for electrification of buses by using Transjakarta as a case study explained. And later on, we will also have a breakout room sessions to further push on the issue and to discuss further on how to conduct an analysis and barriers and opportunities to electrify public transportation fleets, especially in, uh, in the case of Jakarta. And later on, we would like to have other participants from outside Jakarta to also gather in the main room to present the findings to other cities as well. So please do join us again next week, ladies and gentlemen. And last but not least, I, Sarah Wayne, would want to say thank you again and we look forward in welcoming you again next week in our next workshop session so please do stay safe stay healthy and see you again wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good day and goodbye